But you know, there is a handbook which we use at postgraduate level where research is connected. So it's what to get this copy. And, the, and the, if you don't know why it is, come to our directorate, we shall give you this copy. And the, ensure, maybe you discuss it also with your supervisors. Now, there are a few things in this guideline that I want to highlight out. We have changed some few things uh, in this guideline. You need to note that, uh, for example, uh, there are some graduation conditions that we have uh, um, amended. As a candidate, you must have published at least one paper from your thesis uh, in a peer-reviewed recognized journal where the supervisor is a co-author. We're encouraging this so that we, we, we help you in the quality. I know some people having it a problem but it's an encouragement, not encourage you to publish. Because when you, you come to do a master's, you are joining the level of knowledge production. And therefore, you need to disseminate your information. So I want to encourage you to publish in a, a peer-reviewed journal. These journals are many. We also have journals at the university. You can uh, publish in our own journals. You can publish anywhere else with your supervisor. So I want to encourage you to do that. Of course, uh, we, we know uh, where you have challenges, we shall help you. And the much as I think it's a condition, but we shall see how to go about it. But we want to encourage you to publish. The other thing you need to note on, uh, on the changes is that uh, I hope you are aware that, uh, that you must have been duly assessed and scored at least 60%. The pass mark is 60%. Uh, so you need to know that very well that you have been assessed, your decision has been assessed and the scored at least 60%. And the final submission, a successful proposal shall score a minimum of 60% also, okay? And, the, and, and so you need to note that those are things you'll get them in the guideline when you get it. So without wasting a lot of time, uh, I want to invite our dear vice chancellor to give us open remarks and to open this uh, seminar. Professor, you're most welcome. Uh, director of graduate studies and training. The professors here in the room present. Dear students, both those are online and offline. Good morning. I'm glad that uh, such a seminar has been organized to kickstart our master's students on their journey in undertaking effective research. Our colleagues, research undertaking at Nkumba University is changing very rapidly. And this is why we are going to continue giving such seminars so that we can effectively output the best of our research that is going to move the university to a better heights. And this is why you are here for such a seminar. We decided to make sure that no classes happen so that you come and receive these uh, sessions which are very good for you to kick start you. So I welcome all of you. Please feel at home, enjoy the day, and make sure you don't go away without anything. The experts in the room here and whatever they are going to be giving to you 
is very, very important for your journey. And therefore, I would really want to request you to take it seriously, pay attention, avoid the to and flow going out. Do not forget to switch on, to switch on your phone after the, sem uh, the seminar. That means that it has to be off during the seminar. So don't forget to switch it on again. As part of my remarks, I want to tell you a few things. One, you need to know your expectations right from the beginning. As a research student on your journey to undertaking that dissertation, what are you expected to output at the end of the day? Something that you will never forget that I'm going to say today is that uh, at Nkumba University, the time has come that nobody will ever give you the degree. You'll have to work for that degree and therefore you'll be expected to effectively undertake your research to completion. So you need to work for that dissertation and defend it at the end of the, 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 the time of your research. As the director has indicated, you need to follow the laid out procedures to the dot. If you are told you have to do A, B, C, D, please, we have become more than serious and we are not going any backward. So follow the procedures to the dot. He has told you it is a requirement to generate a research paper at the end of your dissertation before you can be ticked to go for the graduation. It's not only helping the university, it is actually helping you as the student. So take it seriously. We need to start doing what the best universities do across the world. If you want to be like them. Meeting your supervisors regularly is something that you are going to take very, very seriously. Some students don't take it seriously and they come at the end and they want the supervisor to simply sign them off now. Regular monitoring of that supervision is going to be a must. If you don't get along with your supervisor, please inform your dean and they will find another one, but not to simply stay away. That is very critical for your research undertaking. One of the things that you need to be aware of is a plagiarism. That is academic theft, using other people's work, calling it your own. We really encourage you to desist from going into that direction. We have a plagiarism software now. We shall catch you. And when we catch you, that is the end. Because the universal procedures clearly laid it out when somebody is caught in that dismissal. So please do not fail to acquire a degree because you have plagiarized, you have gone and stolen other people's work and then made it yours. We have seen that in the past and we have caught them and we shall catch you. I'm sure you're not going to that direction and uh, that's what we encourage. Please avoid plagiarism. Something else you need to be aware about, avoid creating results. It's so easy to create the results, create a population of a hundred, develop all those results and all that. 
what I want to let you know that the human mind is very, very, uh, I would say programmed. You will create the things the same way and the trend will be formed. So don't fall into that trap. If it's research, go out there and do the research. You need to teach yourself how to uh, self-learn. What I have to let you know, you will not learn by osmosis. That the content will come out of the books, the journal papers and get into you. No, you have to just read them. There is no way you are going to ground yourself in the research without reading. You'll definitely have to read. Do not expect a supervisor to read for you. You just need to read it. So if you're not used to reading, please learn the art now because it's going to be part of you on your journey in undertaking that effective research. So please teach yourself how to self-learn. Undertaking research may be a lonely journey and may sometimes be left in that research jungle alone. I encourage you not to be there alone. You are not the only person undertaking research in your class. You are several of you. Learn how to create your own research groups where you'll discuss and learn from each other. That will help you so, so much while undertaking your research. Please, it's something very good, learn how to do it. As you undertake that research journey, always have what we call a research work plan. That will be very, very important for you to understand how you are moving along in achieving your milestones. If you don't have that, you'll never know whether you're achieving or not achieving, whether you're getting there or not getting there. Have that work plan. It will be very beneficial to you. Whenever you go for research supervision, remember to carry with you that research handbook. Sometimes you may go there with your head assuming that all everything will get into you by osmosis from your supervisor. I bet you are wrong. Please write that important and useful information as you go along. So if you happen to have entered this room without a research handbook, I think you are in the very wrong place. You just need to go out, go out there, buy one and come back because you need it. Some of the information you get from here, you may never get it from your supervisors or from somebody else, but you may need it. And lastly, I'm sure many of you have heard about the 80 20 rule of research. Please use it. Know where your 80% is coming from and how you put in your 20%. Let it not be the reverse that you are using 80% to give you 20%. No, it doesn't work that way. You need to use your 20% to get the 80% of your research output. So what is that you are putting in of your 20% to give you a bulk of your 80% in terms of research undertaking? If your colleague has already read a paper which is useful to you, can you get your colleague to discuss for you what they read? You are tapping into their time to give you knowledge. 
80%. Use it. I know it's not going to be an easy journey going along, but I know you can make it. Just pick the skill. Would want in Kumba to output some of the best research in this country can have. That is the journey we started. We are doing a lot of publications. We want you to be part of them and very good publications. We encourage you to write for the journal. It's already, the Nkumba Research Journal is already out. We encourage you to publish for the conference. We have an annual conference. And remember, all your abstracts, your work will appear at a particular point in time under the compendium. And we shall not allow good work to get in there. So please be part of that journey. One day you look back and know that this particular seminar was very, very important for you. I want to wish you the best of the day. Please pick as much information as possible from it. I encourage you to keep on your masks on because you know what is happening in the world. I know even how we are seated here is unacceptable. And some of you may be the people who are charged to actually look out for such gatherings. Please bear with us today because we need it and you need it. I know many of you have been vaccinated but does not take away the fact that the virus is still at rampage and finding us wherever we are. So keep on that mask uh, at any time so that uh, we still need you at, um, up to uh, the end of your research. So thank you so much again, uh, director and your staff for organizing for this. making sure that those who are online are ably receiving this. Uh, thank you for that too. And to the rest of the experts here, we appreciate well, your time and the efforts that you are going to put in to deliver what you are going to deliver to the students. To the students, thank you so much for sparing time also coming in person to attend. I'm sure by the end of the day, you'll be happy. I wish you all the best, and I would want to declare this research seminar open. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, uh, the Vice Chancellor, for those good remarks. And thank you for reminding our colleagues, our students, Yes, we have Nkumba Research uh, Abstract Compendium. If you go on our website, you will see already the abstracts of the previous master's class that graduated. They are already there. You go on our website, you'll see the compendium of abstracts. You'll see them. And that's what is going to happen to you also. Once you finish, we shall put all your abstracts in the compendium for the entire world to see. Okay, so that they can look for those they want. They will follow, many are following us, telling us we want this research, we want this research, and that's where we're going. So thank you very much, Prof, for that. Uh, we are, I'm going to hand over the mic to the chairperson of the session. And the, this is the, also Professor Richard Mwirimuvi. He will introduce to us the presenter and the time uh, he's going to use to take Professor, you're most welcome. Uh, thanks very much, Director. Um, members, first of all, I want to welcome you to this important <coughs> seminar. Uh, first of all, I start with our Vice Chancellor, 
You're most welcome, sir. Uh, the professors were here and our students at master's level uh, protocol observed. Um, I am the one going to chair for the first session this morning, uh, which will take place from starting of course now at, at nine and I will end around the uh, one o'clock this afternoon. Um, what is going to be addressed this morning is the introduction, uh, which will be presented by Professor Raj, uh, whom you are seeing there. Actually, the introduction talks about the what, okay? Get to know that, what are you going to do? The what? Then you're going to see the literature review, which is asking you where, where are you going to get that information, which is going to guide you for your research. Uh, in the afternoon, we'll continue with the methodology, uh, which will address the issue of where, okay? So I leave that for the experts to carry it out. My work is only to chair this morning. Um, as a chair, I want to request you members to make sure that if you have questions, can you please write them down on a paper? Because some of you may not be able to ask all the questions and have them answered. So my request is get a piece of paper, write down your questions, pass them over to me as the chair. Huh? That will make my work very easy. So thanks very much for that. Uh, Professor Raj, you have, <laughs> I see there, you're already in the chair now. You're most welcome, Professor Raj. He's a senior professor here. He has been here for quite a long time as a dean, as a senior researcher. Uh, he's in the School of Sciences for some of you who may not have met him. So Professor Raj, sir, you're most welcome this morning. And let us pray God gives you the energy to take us through and the wisdom. Thanks very much. Hey, hold it or do I press it down? Yeah, I can hold it. Uh, good morning. Um, thank you, Chairperson. The VC who is here with us, the Chairperson, the Director, the Professors who are present here, the lecturers so who may be even supervisors who are here, and uh, this master's degree students. Uh, I'll start with mentioning, announcing that uh, co copies of uh, my presentation will be circulated to you in soft copies, particularly the write-up on this presentation. It may not be the, the one which I'm presenting here, but the, right, the detailed write-up of the presentation is going to be circulated to you by the directorate. Yeah. I'm also assuming that you already have gone through um, the conceptualization of research idea and you have come up with research title so that this particular presentation is on introduction. 
the formulation of the introduction introductory section of the of a master's degree dissertation uh, you have taken it off Yeah. We can do, yeah, correct. Uh, as you can see from the topic, this uh, presentation is for, on formulation of the introduction chapter. Uh, I'll start off with uh, mentioning the importance of the introduction chapter. Introduction discusses the meaningfulness of the issues to be investigated, the justification and significance of that study and the expected outcome. It places the study within the larger context of the scholarly lecture of a literature which is available. Uh, it also attracts the reader's attention and retains it. The, the introduction simply asks you, the introduction actually is an answer to the question, what and why? So if you know exactly what you're going to do research on, then you know the what, and this should be described in detail in the, in, the, in, the, in the introduction chapter and the why that research should be conducted. And this should also be dis dis uh, uh, described and formulated in the introduction chapter. So that the introduction can lay the foundation for the problem identified. It defines what the problem is and gives direction for further literature review and for methodology in addition to giving reasons as to why the problem is important. Uh, in today's coverage, I'll take you back briefly on uh, definition of research, yeah. conceptualization, research proposal, and the dissertation before I cover the, intro the introductory section of the dissertation before and conclusion. Now, obviously there is always something that is unknown. That thing that you don't know, you would like to know. So the quest for knowledge is very, very fundamental human nature. And it is important that things that you don't know, you, you ask a question on it, investigate and find an answer. So here with the definition of research, we, we say it is a systematic and orderly way of finding answers to question. It also means pose a question according to Creswell, collect the data, to answer the question and present an answer to the question. That is research. In summary, which I normally summarize for the, pop, for the sake of students, is that research is an organized, systematic, and creative study or investigation whose objective is to discover new facts or information 
to increase the stock of knowledge. Now, uh, since we have students here, I would like you to I would like you to think of an area in your own discipline where there is a possibility of generating new information.
be the first part that you put forward. Then the problem statement, the statement of the problem. The third element is the objectives. The fourth element of the introduction is research questions and hypotheses. The fifth uh, element is justification of the research. And the sixth element is the significance of the research. The seventh element is the scope. Then we have the conceptual framework, which other people tend to include in the literature review. But there are other, for, for purposes of uh, dissertations, it normally comes in the, under the introduction. Then you have a series of, uh, of definitions of terms.
explain the methodology and organize the study in clearly defined parts or phrases. Um, can go forward. Once, once the specific objectives and uh, the main objective, the specific objectives have been addressed, you can proceed to element number four, which deals with the research questions and all hypotheses. This, the, the research questions or hypotheses identify the phenomena to be investigated by, by carrying out the proposed study. It focuses the study into a narrow topic area and guides every aspect of the research project, including the literature, review, the design of the study, data collection, data analysis, interpretation of results, and even the direction of the discussion. The eventual findings and conclusion drawn should address the research questions. Because when you, when you convert the specific objectives into research questions. That research questions takes you back to the definition of research, okay? Getting answers to questions, because if you don't convert the specific objectives into research questions, it may, you know, you, you may not be in a position to get the answers to your objectives well, but once you have converted into specific into research questions, then you know research questions have to be answered. And in answering the research question, you are actually uh, getting your results that you intend to get. So the eventual findings and conclusion drawn should address the research questions. Research questions should not should not be too broad and not have been answered previously, but, but the answers ought to be beneficial. Now, uh, research questions and hypothesis. Hypothesis, of course, is a focal statement about an expected relationship between two variables through tests. The objective is to decide whether to accept or reject the hypothesis as stated. You can, in, in research, you can uh, have your research questions or you can have uh, the hypothesis. When the research is quantitative, in most cases, hypothesis can work, but where it is qualitative research, I think research questions are better utilized rather than hypothesis. Uh, so the objective is to decide whether to accept or reject the hypothesis as stated. Example of null, null and alternative hypothesis. Uh, I think I stated, I, I, I covered, I've given them on page eight of the detailed description, I picked it from uh, Mwanjololo's uh, thesis, which is uh, given for you as an example of, uh, uh, of research hypothesis. The fifth element of the introduction is justification. This is the rationale for the research or the reason why the research is being done. The importance must be spelled out. Assessment of the justification is again given to you on page eight of the detailed uh, material, but justifiable research should relate to, should relate the research and the findings to practitioners and professional peers according to our friend Pajaris. Then the sixth element of the introduction, 
yeah, is significance of the research. Yeah, this is part where the research explains how the research would be beneficial to specific people or to part of society and how the beneficiaries could use the findings. You remember the justification was basically focusing on the importance of the research where this and the significance is focusing on the usefulness of the research. So it is up to you with respect to the title of the research to explain in detail what the importance is of their research and what the justification is and what the significance is. Uh, a, for example, a good significance should have satisfactory answers to the following questions. Why is this research necessary? What are the, what are the, Brother, how does it link to other knowledge? How does it stand to inform policy making? Is it necessary to understand uh, for the understanding of the world? What new perspective will it bring to the topic? What use will it bring to others in this field? With whom can the result be shared? So such questions would lead you to answers that would give appropriate significance for the topic that you have selected. The seventh element of the introduction is the scope of the study. You have basically three, but the fourth one I've added, the, the first one, the first part of the scope is the contextual scope, which should clearly define the issues to be covered. The issue, what is the research focusing on? That should come out very clearly. statement on where the research is taking place is very important. The third aspect of the scope is on temporal. This is the temporal scope, the time frame. And the time frame here is divided into two. You have your time frame for the study you're doing and the time frame your study covers. What period does your study covers? Certain, certain topics have to be specific, okay? Oh, they're not, this thing keeps on bothering me. Hmm. And, and the final part of the scope is the logistical scope, okay? The required resources that must be available because if the required resources like uh, the, the tools that you intend to use are not available and the um, funding, okay, may not be available, et cetera, and that part, I've included it as part and parcel of the scope. But otherwise, originally, the scope is supposed to be covering the contextual, spatial, and temporal. But logistical aspect of it is very important also. So I thought that aspect should be included. Uh, the eighth element of the introduction 
which I said some people, particularly at PhD level, is included in the literature review. But in most cases, just because of because conceptualization is done in the introduction to answer the question, what and why? So the, con the conceptual framework is included under the at dissertation level for to literature review, fine, which is also okay. But what it covers is that uh, it is an intermediate theory that connects all aspects of an inquiry from the problem statement through objectives, research questions and hypothesis or hypothesis, literature review, methodology, data collection to analysis. It is used to clarify concepts and propose relationships among the concepts of, of the study and provide a contextual a context for interpreting the study findings or explaining observation. It explains either graphically or in narrative form, the key factors, constructs, or variables to be studied and the presumed relationships among them. I have, I think, uh, a diagram there, which uh, gives the relationships that should be drawn diagrammatically. Uh, the idea of conceptual, conceptual framework is that you have <laughs> causes. For example, when you ask a question, a research question to be answered, normally you have issues which should be really containing the indicators of the of, of the of the issues, okay, the indicators of the issues which you describe as the independent variables, okay. Those independent variables are the ones which, when you get a solution to, the solution that you get would be the dependent variables. So you have you have, for example, in some quantitative research, you have causes, and then you have effects, okay? The causes would be independent variables, and then the effects would be the dependent variables. And in between, what you do to achieve the, to get the solution would be the intervening variables, or the variables that you, know, you utilize to eventually reach your final decision in which is the final res results, the final solution to the issues that you are seeking answers to. So that is in brief, the conceptual aspect of the conceptual framework. Then we have, of course, the ninth element, which is definition of terms. The text of the proposal must be understandable to a general reader who may not know much about the proposed research problem, okay? In your research, you use certain terms sometimes, and this, these terms, which if they're likely to be controversial, is better that you define, so that your reader understands that particular word, the way you understand it, okay? You are re the reader of your dissertation would understand the you know the the words the way you understand because English English words can be interpreted in many ways, and unless and if unless you define it properly, somebody can misinterpret your what you mean when you, when you use certain words. So when you find that that, that particular word is likely to be controversial, it's better to define it. We have a lot of it in science, okay? So in science, you, uh, there are certain terms which must be defined. There may not be as many, but at least four, five, or six of them which are likely to be... Oh, how did it go there?
I'm almost finishing. Yeah, we were at the definition of terms when the technicalities came, problem with technicalities came in. Uh, words that have different meanings in the context of the research from traditionally accepted meanings must be defined. Reference should be made to authoritative sources when defining. And the terms being defined should be arranged alphabetically and the definition should be stated in complete sentences. Uh, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, this chapter on introduction provides the necessary information on the topic of the proposal or of the topic of a dissertation to the reader. It answers the question, what is the research about? Is it important? Is it worth doing? It begins with the background information on what is being proposed, which helps to introduce a reader who is unfamiliar with the research topic and defines the issues to be addressed in the problem statement. It includes a brief summary of literature related to the research topic because in the background, you obviously did quite a bit of literature review to just, you know, to support the statement, to support the importance of the research, to support the significance of the research. You did some literature review. So that must be, that is obviously included. It includes a brief summary of the literature related to the research topic, besides outlining the objectives, the research questions, or hypothesis, justification, significance, scope, and the conceptual framework. Uh, with that, I think, ladies and gentlemen, I end there. If there are questions, you are free to discuss. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Professor Roach, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, can we please clap again for the professor? Um, thanks very much for that clap. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear students, you have heard what the professor has presented in chapter one, okay, answering the what and the why, okay? Starting with the background to the study, going down to the problem statement, going down to the purpose, okay? Um, coming to the objectives, uh, research questions, hypotheses, okay? So, uh, justification, significance. Um, I think I've heard of those things. So if you have some questions to ask, please, you better. Uh, there is somebody who has, yes? Uh, I think the technology, the technology this morning has, is not favoring us so much. I don't know why. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Hello, are you hearing me now? Yes, we can. Yeah. So I was just going through what the professor recovered, but somebody has a question around there, I don't know. Please, before we started, I requested you to write down some of your questions so that we can be able to answer them, okay? Can you pass over some of the papers you have? Yes, please. Thank you. 
Uh, can you please speak louder? Um, I just wanted to make an announcement. Uh, we are having the washrooms down there, okay? Uh, the professor is saying, you better announce your name and then you continue with the question. Um, I think it's better we get all the questions at once and then the professor can be able to, to answer, please. Another question? Then, Professor, please, can you kindly answer that question? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question that you have uh, posed. Yes, references can be cited in the introduction. Um, and included there because what it is is that right from where you are beginning to write the background to the conceptual framework you are constantly referring to literature to back up any statement that you are making so citation can be made right from the beginning of your introductory section through the literature review, which you are going to listen to next, and methodology, as well as discussions uh, of results, things like, so literature review is cited throughout. It is a, if you saw the diagram I gave you for motivation, literature review goes right through the research, the research process from beginning to end. Thank you. Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, uh, allow me to say something. I'm wondering why master students are not asking questions. Have you understood everything clearly? Because this is a seminar, you came to learn. Please feel free to ask questions, okay? So that we have a number of people here to help you understand things that, that have been disturbing you. Don't get uh, shy to ask. Yes, there are many people here. Come near here. Hey. Please, Roger, move very fast. Hmm? Hmm? Yeah, my name is uh, C. That's a uh, Dama. My question is. Why I thought is not used for quantitative. I was saying, why, why is that the hypothesis yeah <laughs> Yeah. 
to make that longer. My question is quite That question and the uh, topology. Yeah, um, th thank you for these uh, two additional questions with respect to the hypothesis and research questions uh, where they refer to um, qualitative or quantitative. Uh, and I said both can be used, but majorly qualitative would go with research questions and quantitative with a hypothesis. The, the reason is that in quantitative, you are dealing with facts, okay? You are dealing with facts, like how tall is somebody, okay? When that is measured, the number is known, it's, in, it's measurable. Whereas qualitative is dealing with the views of of, of respondents, views of individuals. With, it's dealing with words. And that's why it, uh, questions are more likely to be better utilized in that area rather than in a quantitative research. I think this uh, answers both your questions, the two questions which you have posed. Because you have quantitative and quality. Sometimes you have got mixed type of research, okay? Where, where you use quantitative and qualitative at the, you know, in the same research, there you can have practically both uh, type of, uh, uh, you can have both research questions and hypothesis accordingly. Thank you. Um, I think members, you got that one very right, okay? The qualitative talks about the narration. You have to narrate the story, what you're studying, okay? The quantitative is majorly when using numbers. And when you use those numbers, you have to prove. So at the end of the day, you need a regression. But as with qualitative study, there's no regression which would be what required. But this afternoon, we are coming to the methodology. So that thing will come a little bit later, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, if there are no more, no more questions for this uh, presentation, we, according to our program, we are meant to go for break tea, but I, I, the way I see your faces, you seem not to be very hungry yet. Uh, maybe, I don't know whether the second presenter is around. Dr. Chinji, is he around? No. Secretary, is Dr. Chinji around? Okay, I think let's have a break tea. Okay. Um, I am waiting for your questions, please. If you have more questions, write them down. Professor Raj is willing to answer them. Okay.
Hello, hello, hello. I'm suggesting you uh, keep on your seats. Uh, since the, our service provider is not here for tea, and we want to have an adjustment. Uh, IT, IT, can I present my mind because uh, we have time? Eh? So we can uh, we can have. Uh, hmm? I can present the last presentation, yes, as we wait so that we don't uh, lose time. Uh, excuse me, members. Uh, because breakfast is not yet there, uh, the director wants to take to have the opportunity or presenting at this time, okay? So, uh, Professor Sima, please. Uh, let us give the opportunity to Professor Sima to present, okay? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, Professor Richard Mumumi, uh, I want to, hello, Chairman. <laughs> hello? So uh, we, are, we are just adjusting because our tea is not yet ready and uh, the second presenter is here, is waiting for his time at 10.30. Instead of us losing more time, I want to go on with my presentation. And uh, mine is a simple one, uh, is about how to publish from a thesis or a dissertation. As you know, uh, we have just informed you that uh, we want to encourage our master students at Nkuma University to publish. And some of them have been publishing, by the way, but others wonder how do we publish from a dissertation. And uh, I thought I would go through some of these few things. We, we, we discuss them and see how we can. And uh, I will look at the introduction and we'll see the difference between a dissertation and a journal article. And I'll look at the
and also time consuming. And that's why many people don't publish because they have finished a book and they just dump it there. But uh, many, some people have gone ahead for bliss from those dissertation. I have done so around seven articles out of my dissertation. However, there are ways of easily managing this and that's what we want to go through. But what are the characteristics of a, a journal article? One, a journal article meets journalistic standards. There are standards of journals. You must know a journal you're going to publish. And, uh, and uh, of course, the standards are not the same as for the for a dissertation or a thesis. A, an article of a journal is reviewed, what we call it, a panel of blind reviewers. And not one, not two, they could be more than three. And that's why journal articles are taken on high stand more than even a book on rating, when they are rating you for promotion. Journals sometimes score highly because they are peer reviewed more than even the books. Uh, of course, the journal has sections. You find you have, uh, you have your topic, you have abstract, you have an introduction, you have a border, you have a conclusion. Uh, a journal article has word count. You see, you don't just write anyhow. Eh? The, the words that you are supposed to, either to, to keep following the journal you're following. And uh, it has a manuscript format and you must have a format that is given to you by the journal where you're going to publish. And it must be concise on literature. You don't just uh, do literature or the whole literature you have. You must be selective, you get a few uh, literatures that you want to, to, to use in that article. And uh, then uh, also you must select findings that presented. What findings do you want to publish? Not all the findings you have in your dissertation will be uh, published in an article. You may choose to have maybe one objective or two objectives, but not all. And then it has also verb tenses that are fairly consistent. Uh, then how do we reduce the word, the word or the word count? Yes, we note that a thesis or dissertation is bigger than a journal article. So we need to reduce the word count of an article to meet the journal guidelines you, are, you, you, you want to publish in. Because every journal will have their own guidelines. And so the following broad guidelines I'm going to show can help us in the reduction. However, I want you to note that uh, uh, the, 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 these are generic because you may have uh, uh, we have different um, word counts. What I'm going to give you here is generic, but you, you, know, you need to know which, value, which journal article you want, I mean, the journal you want to publish to, and then you ask the number, the numbering. So, but uh, this one, I'm just using it for the sake of uh, the presentation. Now, a journal article is much shorter than a thesis. Generally speaking, the total word count of a manuscript for a journal should be into uh, less, okay? Uh, for months from introduction through to conclusion, you may have between 5,000 and 7,000 words. And here, this is the word count of our, I think our journal here, of Nkumba Research Journal is around that. And I think the business journal is also around 5,000, 7,000 word count, okay? And the, uh, but depending on your subject area and the general specifications, this number may vary. That's what I'm saying. Now, the abstract for a journal article is usually around 150 to 250 words in length. You can write a short abstract by briefly mentioning the background of the study. Uh, of course, the background of the study which you have the main methods used in the study and the key findings from the study. So we're trying to find out how do you reduce the word count. So you don't write everything there, but select some few things that are going to, to, to help you to come up with a shorter version of your dissertation into a, a, an article. The introduction for dissertation is usually comprehensive and in depth. So you need to know that you can't produce all that in a, an article. So on the other hand, the introduction for a journal article must be concise with the assumption that the target audience you are writing is already aware of what you're writing. 
because journals will write specifically targeting some fields. Okay, so you don't need to give them all these details. They know already some. So you need to have an introduction which is shorter or brief. The introduction of a journal article should aim at setting the context for presentation of the data or results from the study. And ideally, the introduction should be less than one third of the total word count of the article. So you need to how uh, many words you want or you are required to write, and then you should get at least your, your introduction to be one third. Now, assuming that your article is a, between 3,000 and 4,000 word count, then the introduction should be limited to around 1,000 words. Okay? And now, a census includes all the results obtained from the study, but a journal article reports only the key findings from your study that support your hypothesis or your research questions. You don't put everything there. You get out few that are going to support what you want, right? And the, the methods and also results, the, uh, the, the, the methods and results sections together should be limited around one third of the overall article. And often the results from a thesis can result in two to three journal articles or more. You can have your thesis or dissertation, you are about four objectives or three. You can decide to just pick one objective, especially for the PhD. One objective is enough to write an article, but even at the master's, they all now want to groom you. You can have your objectives in a, in a way that you can publish articles from just one objective, you get an article. Or you can combine two objectives, you get out an article. Okay? But not all, not everything, not all objectives you can build an article because you have a word count to note about. Now, the discussion, just like the introduction, needs to be focused and concise in a journal article in comparison to a thesis or a dissertation. You, yes, you must, yes, you may need to discuss, but again, in a concise way, okay? Not the way you, you discussed in a dissertation. Now, once again, I want you to note that it is recommended that the discussion section be restricted to around one third of the total word count. I think you are following me on how I'm trying to reduce the words. Yes, uh, the reference list in a journal article should only include the reference uh, articles that are cited in the paper. Uh, you have to be careful here. In a journal article, you don't need so many references. And of course, uh, every journal will tell you how many they may want. But yes, they have their own specifications about the maximum number of references permissible. But generally, try not to include more than 30 references in a, a journal article. Please check the specifications of your target journal that you want to publish your article. And the, the maximum number of tables and the figures that you can include in a journal paper also depends on your target journal. And is usually anywhere between five to 10. But all in all, if you're going to publish, you need to know the specifications of the journal where you're going to publish. They'll have all these things specified out. How many tables they want, uh, not more than this, but this, most of them are either between five and 10, not more than that. Now, steps, to go through to come up with a journal article. Now, the following are the steps you will likely have to go through to come up with a, a journal article. One, you need to identify the best journal for your work, where do you want to publish your article, and so that your article is within the journal, the journal's aim and scope, and uh, also check the journal's recommended structure and the reference style, because not all journals have the same referencing style. Others we have APA, others Chicago, others for us here we, in Yunkumba, we use uh, uh, APA, six, which is now seventh edition. But others may have Chicago, may have so many different styles. Uh, two, you need to shorten the length of your thesis. Treat your thesis as a separate work. That is separate work, you want to just pick out something to publish. 
Paraphrase, but do not distort the meaning. Paraphrase your, what you want to write in a journal article, but don't distort the meaning because there's a meaning you want to communicate to people out of your work. Select and uh, repurpose parts of your thesis. You select them and, uh, and you put, if you have an objective, you know which one will come first and whatever, you can reorganize them to see how you're going to pick out information. And I will show you this in a log framework. Uh, thirdly, reformat the introduction as an abstract. Your introduction you have in a thesis can be reformulated and you get an abstract of a journal article out of it. So you shorten the introduction to 100, 150 words, but maintain key topics to hold the, research, the reader's attention. Don't lose the meaning. Use the introduction and discussion as a basis for the abstract. Okay? Because I'm, I'm not sure what, what, do you, what do you pick from the abstract to, into an article. I mean, from the dissertation to an article. Uh, firstly, you need to modify the introduction. If your thesis has more than one research questions or hypotheses, uh, then you need to find out which one are relevant for the paper you want to write, for the journal you want to write. Consider combining some of the research questions, as I said, or your, your hypothesis, you can combine them. Focusing on just one for the article, because you can actually publish each objective into a different journal article, as I said. I, for my thesis, I had about three objectives, I, around three or four of them, and I, I got an, object, an article from each of them. So it's up to you. You can say, I'm going to get an, an article from each objective. Now, what the, the, maybe I will advise you that you need to use a previously published papers in that journal you are targeting. Look for the journal and see how they publish. At least three of them, look at them and read from the target journal. For example, so you get good examples to follow. Uh, if you want to publish in our business journal, we have journals here. The Incumbent International Research Journal has not yet published. It's going to come out, I think, in August. So at least it's there, but we have the guidelines we can give you. Tighten the method section. Keep the discussion about your research for approach short. Uh, of course, here again, you'll use the, uh, the journal you want to publish in. You can see how they do the methods, what they, what they, what they uh, mention there in the method section. Then report main findings in the results. Report many findings, don't report everything. Expose your many findings in the result section in the concise statements, okay? Because you have a word count over 3,000, 4,000, or 5,000, 7,000. Discuss, the discussion must be clear and concise. Again, begin by providing an, uh, an interpretation of your results. What is it that the, we, we have learned or people want to learn from your research. Straight the findings to the literature clearly. Discuss how your findings expand knowledge or previous perspectives in that field where you're writing. If you're in security, you want the security people to know what you have written and uh, briefly present ways in which future studies can build upon your work and address limitations in your study. Limit the number of references. I've already said that because journals don't need so many references, but again, you have to look at the journal you're going to publish to. Uh, now, I have a logical framework matrix that I want to practically to show you what I did. And I will ask IT first to come and help me here because it's not on the pop, it is a, a, a word. Is here. Hey. Yeah, I think you can see it. Now, if you already have a, a, a don't have virus. <laughs> okay, uh, hold on. I uh, want to bring you to the, that projector.
So uh, members, as we, 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 we do this, I want to encourage you that it is possible and very easy to publish, especially when you have a dissertation already. People want to publish, the, 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 their problem is, what do I write? If you already have information to write about, it's not easy to write an article because you may think of so many things, but already have a dissertation, you have information. So all what you need is to find a way of getting this information from the dissertation and to an article or to a book. And my advice is that before you write a book, first write journal articles. Because once you write a book, you're not allowed to write articles out of that book. So, but you are free later on to write a book and even include some of your information the articles in the, to your book. I hope I'm clear there. So you first exhaust, you write your, get your, your, your articles you want to write before you turn into your dissertation into a textbook. Okay, now I have a logical framework uh, matrix which can help us to chapterize or uh, chapterization and, and, and into publication. Now, of course you have a thesis here, you can, and you can do this out your own, you draw up this, you begin, put your title there, uh, your names is there, that's, those are my names, and the, 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 <coughs> the required, so now I put my objectives here, these are the, the, the search objectives of that uh, thesis, and why am I putting them here? To help me know where to find the information. Now, here, my objective one is to identify the key intelligence oversight decisions and discuss the operations. Where is this data found? You are free to get it. Okay, let me hold on. I wait for colleagues behind also to follow. No, they're going to take my seat, so I'm going to see. <laughs> you can see my things. Which one do we have? Which one? Hmm? Hmm? This one is small. Which one? <laughs> yeah, chair person, I'll say time up when I can stop here. Oh. Yeah. Hello, hello. Can this can they use this one? Mm -hmm. But what are you looking for? Not confusing my thing. Okay, hello. Hello, hello. Hello, this one. Hello. Yes, um, 
Now it is the IT disorganizing you, not in <laughs> Yeah, but he's trying to help uh, colleagues at uh, who are using the projector to to follow what I'm I'm showing you here. Yes, I was seeing saying that uh, yes, um, I'm using I'm giving you a live example that this is a thesis I converted and got out publications, and I'm saying. Uh, if you look at this, uh, it is important you put down your objectives because it's the objectives where you're going to get the, the articles to write. Uh, it's the objectives that you, you have findings for. And uh, I, my first objective is here. Now, I put the pages where the data is, where the information is in my dissertation. So if I want the information to do with this objective, I will go uh, and, and to chapter five, uh, chapter six, and I find it summarized in chapter seven. Then uh, the second objective, uh, data is also presented, analyzed in chapter five, chapter six, and chapter seven. And uh, I also uh, look at the, the other objective and uh, I also indicate where I can find the information. Now, you draw this mat uh, logical framework, the matrix I'm talking about here. When you draw this, you present the entire dissertation into this matrix. How? You must have a chapter, uh, a chapter for the thesis or the dissertation here. Now, this column, it is for what you're going to derive, either a journal article or a book chapter. All together. Here, I'm going to put all the chapters as they are, as they exist in the dissertation. In this column, I will put what I'm going to derive from this side to a journal article or a, into a book. Now, in my dissertation, I have chapter one, uh, which is introduction to the study. All this information is in chapter one. Now, as you can see, I could not write anything out in chapter one. So there's nothing here, all together. There's nothing here until I reach chapter two. Chapter two in the dissertation is literature. Now, literature, I have all these sub items in the literature as they exist in the dissertation. You put them here in this column. And as they, they exist, these are just serial numbers, how they are. Now, when I reached chapter two of the dissertation, I realized I can publish something out of my literature review. And indeed, I derived an article. You can see a similar S analysis of literature on intelligence oversight and protection of democracy, the case of Uganda intelligence system. I have an article which I have derived from the literature, which is published. Okay. I go there again in chapter three, that's how it is, the item in chapter three. And the, as you can see, it's blank, meaning that I failed to publish anything in that chapter. Well, now what I did, I left that part, I went to chapter four. Chapter four, my dissertation has these items. I realized I can derive an article out of this chapter. And I derived an article which is a, uh, a similar S intelligence oversight and uh, and beyond intelligence oversight in and beyond Africa, a multi regional analysis. This is also an article published. Chapter five, I have findings of the study, and uh, under this chapter, I have so many findings, and I, I have uh, you can see the, the the objectives and the findings. I put all of them here. Uh, now, I, ha I realized I could derive something out of chapter five. I have a policy brief, which I wrote, strengthening intelligence oversight in Uganda, Africa, and peace and, in Africa and peace and conflicts. This is a general way I published this. And uh, I also got something. Okay, yes, chapter six. In chapter six also, in the dissertation, it is, this is how it is. What they derive from chapter six, this is another objective. I got a, uh, an article 
that is achieving a democratic yardstick in managing intelligence services, a case of Uganda as a transitional democracy. It is an African Peace and Conflict Journal. Coming from a chapter of my dissertation. Chapter seven, I also got a, an article, Understanding the Security Sector in Uganda, the Security Intelligence Missing Link, which is uh, published, I think, in the uh, Police Journal. And so forth and so forth. Time is not uh, our best ally. But uh, what I wanted to show you is that you can do this, all of you, and, uh, and uh, convert your thesis or your dissertation into this log framework, and it will help you to get out articles. Now, after this, actually, I have now, because I got exhausted of the articles, I think around the, maybe like six or five articles from the dissertation, I have now published a book. Okay, and I've closed, I can't publish anything from it. So I have a textbook, eh, which, uh, which was launched, I think, last two weeks ago. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Any question? So uh, thanks very much, Dr. Professor Asimwe, for that presentation. Can we give me another clap, please? Another clap. Um, I think on your behalf, uh, I am personally very much concerned about your publication. One, your master's students who are here for two years. Now, when you start, we are saying that you must publish a paper. And he's saying that his paper which has produced is from the dissertation. Now, are these students, sir, professor, going to produce a dissertation in the first, second semester? Because it's a requirement now of the university that you're not going to graduate unless you are produced an article. Can you please answer that question, sir? Well, it's very, very important for these students. Eh? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for that question. And I want to welcome Dr. Chinji. Uh, I had to come in, I don't want you to go to, to follow, but you. Uh, now, that is a very good question. Yes, every master student is expected to have a dissertation. Um, at the, and the, at every, in various schools, uh, they have the process how they are doing dissertations. But we're encouraging going forward, we're going to find a way of moving together. Okay, when you start, uh, when do you start your methodology? When do you do this? It is something we are going to think about to clear. Of course, we know these have already in the process. We shall be concerned about, we shall be mindful about that. We shall be mindful about those who are coming in when the policy is starting. Uh, so we, we, are, we are human beings. We, we may not sacrifice, uh, we shall not sacrifice them. If it's not possible for them to to publish before they graduate, we shall encourage them to publish, but they can graduate. But it is in their own good. Yeah, let me tell you, publishing is not for me, not for the university, it is for the person. Uh, and we want to encourage them to publish. And uh, I don't know whether I've answered your question. Uh, can we please have some questions? Uh, there is a question at the back, please. Can uh, the mic, please? The mic.
Uh, thank you very much. Yes, uh, a guideline is a guideline. Uh, or law is a law. Once we set it up, it will be a must that you must do that, all of you. And uh, we are saying it is 2020 going forward. But I've just put a rider. I've just put a rider here that we are very sure that uh, we are putting a guideline when some people are already in the process. Therefore, we shall be mindful about that. But we shall encourage you to publish. If you don't publish, it will not be a punishment that we shall stop you from graduating, especially you who are already in the process. But going forward, those who will be coming, it will be a must for them to publish before they graduate. All together. I think I'm clear there. Yes. Fine. Okay. It is the national council, but it's okay, no problem. National. Um. Okay, let's have the last question, please. Um. Uh, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> uh, this issue of publishing is a very, very sensitive issue. One, it requires you to have time. Two, to have money. Three, to have your supervisor who is capable of taking you through, okay? So I would uh, request that the school of postgraduate, I think, handles that at a, a certain time, okay? Well, we cannot continue with that. We don't have enough time now, okay? Please don't disorganize the chair. I'm just requesting you to allow me to continue with other things. Thank you. Uh, but uh, there's a question somewhere. The last one. I am interested in step number one. As the associate professor talked about identifying the test journals for the article. Now I'm wondering, I'm asking myself here, that as we join the university, we have already written journal so that we begin reading them and identify the article or we, you are interested in seeing uh, the journal that I have produced so that I get the best of it then I produce the article. Because if you look at the name right there, actually it cannot be discussed. Thank you, I've got your question. Let me answer you okay. because of time. Yes, uh, what I meant there is that, uh, yes, there are existing journal, journals in the world beyond Nkumba, beyond Uganda, there are journals there existing. So you need to identify in which journal do you want to publish your work. Some of them are based on the fields, either science or art or agriculture, or whatever. I just said we also have journals here. Yes, we already have a journal being studies and a journal in law, they, they have journals, you can look for them and see how do they publish, how do they publish the articles, that's what I meant. And there are many journals online, you can visit them. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are waiting for breakfast, but uh, I'm not seeing it there. Huh? I don't know what's happening. <laughs> but let's be patient because uh, Dr. King is already here. Uh, I think after breakfast, that's when we shall continue. Otherwise, please write down your questions, which can be answered at a later stage, okay? Uh, uh, Dr. Anna, Dr. Ann. I understand you have a question. Please. Let's continue. Uh, I've just learned from the director that we can continue with the questions um, until uh, 
with the presentation, yeah? Okay. Um, with the questions, I think let's end with Anne. Please, can you? Um, okay. This is for Dr. We shall also tell from graduating, and the deans have already communicated to these master's people. Some of the people who are here are of other 2021 interests. Some are of 2021 interests. So, at what point is this going to be a mark? At what point are they going to be punished and stop from graduating? Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Araho. Hello. Hello. Are you getting me? Hello. Hello. Okay. Hello. Hello. Uh, hold on. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Wao, the Dean of School of Social Sciences, for that. I was somehow getting becoming lenient uh, because of someone who was asking the question. I saw him as if he's, he's really not ready to publish. I got worried that he may collapse. Uh, but uh, I want to tell you that uh, much as I may have said that we may be lenient, our hands may be tied actually, because the National Council has already issued a, a guideline towards that. For us, we are doing it our own, but I'm just being advised here the National Council has even issued a guideline now that in Uganda, all master students must publish. So in that case, uh, I'm going to say that uh, we're going to have, uh, we, can, we can sleep over this. We shall have a policy directive going forward. I, that's what I will say. We shall have to sit as a, as the uh, other policy makers in the university, then the directive will be given. Or oh, is it a what? Uh, we shall have a communication. I'm not uh, where I have said, but let's know that we need to publish. But whether even the 2020 are going to be uh, required to publish before graduation, we shall release a communication later. I think that's what I would say. That will guide all of us. Okay, members, I think we can stop there. The point is noted. The VC talked about it. We have to publish. The director said we have to publish. But time is going to come. What it may become could be mandatory or whatever it is. You may be informed, okay? So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we should proceed with our next. Um, we are going to proceed with the next one. And uh, since I've already chaired two already, can I please request Madam Dr. Simwe? Sorry, Dr. Anne. Dr. Anne, please. Um, because you are supposed to chair for Professor Simwe, and I took your chance. But now we're, you're being requested to come and chair this session, madam. Thank you. Dr. Ann?
Thank you, Professor Richard. Um, I have the pleasure to bring on board another presenter, Dr. Frank P. Ochinji, who is a guru in all that has been said, but is more of a guru in what he's going to talk about on literature review and writing chapter two of a master's dissertation, referencing and citation. I don't want to speak a lot about him. When he speaks, you will know that I shouldn't have even spoken about him. So please put your hands together for the one and only Dr. Pio Chinj. As the doctor comes, please, we're going to share all the presentations with you. Ensure that you leave us with your, your emails. If you don't have an email, you will not share because you can't print out these things. You're going to share them as soft copies. So uh, good morning, uh, colleagues in the, the academia. I'm Dr. Frank Pio Chiinji. Uh, since I'll stand here, uh, allow me to remove the mask when I'm, since I'm standing in a distance. Uh, I'm going to talk about literature review, which you see there. I am an Inkumba made, and I'm proud to be an Inkumba a product. And I'm sharing with you what I've got from Mungkumba. Uh, I have uh, my PhD is in uh, uh, psychology, and I've equally also published. Every year I publish twice minimum. And I've supervised the students. So not to meander a lot, literature review. We want to look at literature review, which is a full chapter in the uh, proposal or in the thesis. And uh, uh, some simple outline. Uh, my presentation will look at uh, what literature review is, some types of review, the steps in conducting literature review, and the structure of literature review. Uh, literature review, according to uh, uh, one scholar, is an account of what has been published. So we look at what has been published, we read what has been published, and we read as we note, we write what has been published by credible scholars and researchers. And we are going to read scholarly publications, literature review reviews, uh, scholarly articles, books. I'm glad that Dr. S uh, Professor Sime was talking about his publication. For the people in the area of security, that can be a beginning point for us to review literature. Uh, published books and other sources like uh, uh, great information, like uh, dissertations, uh, conference proceedings that are on a relevant topic. But again, in simple terms, literature review is about to, uh, the introduction of a topic. We summarize it give the main issue of that topic and give a corresponding example. So members, literature review, as you see in the picture there, it's about reading other people's research, published work that relates with a particular topic that you have identified. We want to see what is good literature review. Some people, I've argued that, one author has argued that good literature review is a synthesis of available research. We synthesize, we evaluate, we critically analyze what one author has said. Does it fit really in the current form of argument? 
Uh, the second one, uh, I talked about the critical evaluation, but still good literature review looks at the breadth and the depth of the discussion and is rigorous, a rigorous method. But poor literature review, what most students do, they go and they make a notation of bibliography. They collect information from one source to another and put it together. And I think that is literature review. That is a compilation. And as your supervisors will tell you, or as you'll be told on the defense panels, that is not literature review. If you bring together bibliography and you only describe what other people have said, it's narrow, it is shallow. There is no discussion. Members, when we talk of literature review, we want to see you discuss. Discuss for us what does author X say, for instance, about a security issue. What does author Y say? Now, what is your voice? We need to see you, the writer, telling us what is your comment on this. And as you are commenting, allow the author's debate as you give us your view. That is literature review. Uh, what do we review? Types of reviews. Uh, some types of reviews we are looking at is study, self-study reviews. If you want to increase your confidence in a given area, either you are an education student or you are a natural science student, you are a student of law, you are a student of psychology, you are a student of social work or social sciences. If you want to increase your confidence in a, a given area, you might make some self-study review. Um, simply that. Second one is the context review. If there is a given project and you want to know the, a certain picture of what this project is all about. Now, if you are looking at historical reviews here, we trace the development of an issue over time. And as you write on given topics, you may call for uh, a review on these particular types of reviews. We look uh, most emphatically, I'm emphasizing theoretical review. The theories that you have reviewed, you will help you to compare how different authors argue on the different theories. And when you review these theories, members do not forget, literature review is about summarizing, synthesizing, comparing, analyzing to get a gap. So when we analyze these theories, we want to see what are the scholarly gaps left by, for instance, a security theorist X. And what, how will your study cover that gap? So that's why you are looking at theoretical reviews. Second last is methodological reviews. Methodological reviews look at the different methodologies that have been used by other authors. By master's degree or PhD, you must have known the literature you are reviewing, which methodology has been used. Does it tell with your research? If it doesn't, then that leaves a gap. So literature review is about telling a scholarly story, but indicating to us, how does it fit into your research? Last one is integrative reviews, which uh, summarizes what is known at a particular point in time on a given topic. So members, as you are going to review, as you're already doing literature review, we need to know which type of review are you making? I, I supervise the students who come up and they say, you know, I have tried writing literature review, but I don't know what to write. I read and I don't know what I should write. So you should know which type of review are you going to make. That will guide the way you are searching. I will show you some table to guide our discussion. According to Cresswell, in 2005, Cresswell gives five steps of conducting literature review. If we are to conduct a scholarly review, step number one, Cresswell argues that identify the key terms or descriptors. Where do we get these key terms? From your topic. A good topic should have, as you were informed by Professor Orach, a good topic should have key variables. The variables of your study form the beginning point for you to begin searching the kind of literature you would like to review. So identify the key terms the key descriptors, and how do you identify them? Members, you see in that diagram, you read. Begin by reading. You will not get literature review by thinking first about what you want to write. No. 
literature review is about reading what has been published. As you read, you keep notes. When you keep notes, you note keywords. So members, as Crossway is arguing, make sure you read information that is only past 10 years back, except if you need classical information that is not in the past 10 years for your study to remain in a current interest. Step number two, according to Cresswell, we need to locate the literature. Where do we locate the literature? Use academic libraries. That's why we have a library here. We have online libraries. And do not limit your search only on an electronic search of articles. Physically go in the library. Since we said the literature review is rigorous, you might end up opening one book over a thousand times before you get a keyword or a descriptor. So that's why we are saying uh, use primary and secondary sources. Primary source points to information that has been researched and reported by the first author or the researcher. And the secondary uh, uh, sources would point to what has been summarized from given reports or written about the information that was first researched. That is step number two, according to Cresswell. Step number three, it will be in step number two, because sometimes you may, according to your topic, you may not be able to get this information from either online, but you may get it from an encyclopedia or a dictionary or a glossary of terms a given handbook, statistical index or indices, reviews and all those synthesis of different books. So members, this will serve us best as a database of where we shall get the information we are to review. Step number three, Questwell points out clear, literature review is about critically evaluating and selecting literature. And if we are to do this, the beginning point, as Professor Solomon was indicating, rely on journal articles that are published in national and international journals. For instance, if we are researching about academic performance, what are the journals that have been published? Go online and you type in, look for journals on academic performance, and you tag even in the last 10 years. Those journals will come. So prioritize your search. First look for a referred journal article or journal articles, then non-referred, then a book or a conference paper. Look for research articles and avoid as much as possible opinions. Members, newspapers, we can rely on them where we are failing to get information. But newspapers is not a beginning point. You know, if we are writing about a given topic like security, yesterday they will say something different, today morning they are changing. So don't rely on opinions. If you are researching, you are writing literature review, we write facts. Academic research is about facts, not opinions or myths. If you rely your search on opinions or myths, it will be sent back at you. That will not, you would have researched, reviewed at a shallow or a narrow, uh, base. And we are saying blend, Cresswell says blend both qualitative and quantitative research, such that your study is well balanced in terms of scholarly weight. Your, your scholarly arguments are well balanced. Step four, according to Cresswell, organize the literature. Now you have read, you need to organize your literature. Create a file or an abstract system that helps you to keep your record which you read later. Remember that each article you read should be summarized in one page. Members containing the following, since we are saying we are using APA, should contain the title. Where do we get these titles? Again, I'm restating from the topic, from your conceptual framework, those key indicator variables is what you are going to search and from what other people have written. In terms of organizing your literature, I, I request we pay uh, close attention here. Organizing sources of literature review or re literature review. 
there are six steps offered here if you had organized our literature. One, keep the chronological level of your review. In other words, chronological we mean review or not that the research was published. For instance, you may say why published this and it was modified or contradicted by X. Then there you are reviewed, you are allowing your research authors to have a discussion or a debate. It's not your opinion you is writing. In literature, if you bring for us, what do the authors say about this particular topic? Number two is by publication or author. Three is by trend. We look at the trend of how issues have developed or evolved. We look at thematic. What are the main ideas? Whenever you are reviewing, pick out, circle out for the main ideas, for the main theories. Who are the major proponents in this study? Again, it may be methodological, whether quantitative or qualitative. Other ways of organizing literature, you might organize it according to topical order, topic by topic. And that creates, you know, when we talk of literature, if you want you to put in your mind a picture of a thread and a needle, you cannot stitch a cloth without a, a needle, not so. You need a thread. So what you are picking from one author, pick, take it as a garment that you are going to stitch to come up with a well-written chapter two. These others we shall read in the interest of time. Uh, number five, what Cresswell points out as the, uh, the fifth step is now rewriting of uh, the literature review. There are two major types that Cresswell points out. You can write your literature basing on themes. A theme is identified and the studies uh, are, found, uh, are found under this theme should be described. So members, you should describe what is under the theme. For instance, if the theme is about the effect of the second wave of coronavirus, how has it affected us? Then you pick out those key, the, what we are calling those themes are those ideas or concepts. Then you broaden what do other authors talk about those ideas. It can be study by study, which is a detailed summary of each study under a broad theme that is provided. So remember, link the summaries or the abstract using transitional sentences. Some people only copy and paste, avoid copy and paste. Transferring information from one book to your empty page that you are feeding, and from another uh, online source to an empty page, second page you are feeding, is not a literature review. Give transitional statements like, hence, However, even if X is saying this and this, however, Y comes in to contradict or to counter that. That's when your voice comes out. And that's when we see that you are reviewing. You are not only transferring information from one source to another. This is a, a good example of what I was telling you, that template. If you have to keep track of your literature review, you need to, number one, start with the reference who is the key author and the year of what you are reading. Then number two, summarize what they are saying. It is a summary, members. Don't lift information from one book to another. Then look at what type of literature are you reviewing, what category, you know? What are the major theories behind? So you can keep a, a table like that to guide you as a review such that you don't read like somebody who is entering in a forest with many trees, but they don't know which direction to take. So this helps you to map out and enables you to avoid the time wasting. Theoretical review, your main research question if your study is qualitative. If your study is quantitative, according to the given uh, supervisor, you may use a hypothesis. So no, which hypothesis am I looking art in this literature that I'm reviewing. It helps give direction. What is your main conclusion? What is the main research design? Which empirical data is there? Then you, you categorize yourself. Is this good literature or it is bad? Are you seeing that? That's when you begin making a scholarly argument. 
you know, in your, when somebody looks at your literature, sees a scholar speaking behind these pages. Not a mere conversation. Literature review is not about writing love letters. You should append the author, the scholarly appeal. Tell us who is the person behind this argument. Good. There are four levels of analysis, four tasks. If we are to analyze literature, and this I said before, members summarize as we did indicate in the table. Synthesize, evaluate, sieve out. Do I need this really for my study or not? And how much do I need? As you are synthesizing members, remember, remember to paraphrase. We shall talk about issues of plagiarism. Paraphrase what you are giving us. Put it in your own statements, the way you understand. If you don't, that is a, a first level of plagiarism. I know we shall see that. Critique. Are you convinced that what this author is saying fits your topic or it doesn't? If it doesn't, then bring that out. Let your voice come out clearly as you are reviewing literature. Then compare. Compare what scholar X is saying against Y and against your work. We have some of these examples. For the people in the area of education and psychology, that's an example I would like to use, or social sciences, depending. This is a good way to summarize, show the summary and synthesis of literature. One, we said, look at the theory. I'm bringing it Jean Piaget's theory, who looks at the stages of cognitive development. But also there is Eric Erickson's stage. Are you seeing that, members? Which is psychosocial, and that is commonly used in the educational psychology. Members, do not forget, you append the source where you read that. Are you seeing that, members? But now the second one is giving us your thesis. Although you brought these other theories, you are bringing it out here that PIJ describes characteristic behaviors, which include the following. Are you seeing that, members? Please make an argument. Converse with these authors as you are writing literature review, not lifting information from one source to another. And that shows us the summary and the thesis. The second example gives us the comparison. The critical response, uh, this is an example, to a portrait of Ferris Whitley often registers disappointment of surprise. So you are beginning to compare, but then you bring in a critique. Some critics complain that the verse of, the, of this African-American slave is insecure. That's one. So it's bringing out how these slaves are insecure and is giving us a source, a pain. If you don't give a source, it becomes an opinion. That's when the author, the, the, the supervisors or on the panel, they will ask you, who else thinks like you that these people are insecure? Then you say, you people are not understanding me. I brought it, I read it somewhere. Where? What? Let your literature speak to us, not so. Uh, imitative, then you give us who says that, you know? So be able to critique. The next one is the structure of literature review. How do we structure? Members, there are three aspects in the area of structure. We are looking at introduction. What do you put in a, an intro, when you're introducing literature review? The second one, we are looking at the body. That's where the hot argument of what we are talking about, the the, 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 the critique, the synthesis, the evaluations should come in the body. And then the last one, you conclude. But each time you are critiquing, bring out what are the major arguments and the debates according to the scholars, as we shall see. So number one, introduction of your literature. Clearly define and explain the primary problem, not so. And this should take us back at your topic, not so. So your topic, remember there are three things that should appear in your introduction. Your topic, the variables, the problem, and the objectives of your study. They should come out clearly. Explain the main conflicts in your literature. What, what is the conflict? You know? And offer the rationale for your choice of given material. You remember the table, this table that we looked at? That table, 
you will get reasons because you you gave us at the end this is good literature this is bad literature this methodology is good and now you are reviewing and giving us the rationale for your literature what is the rationale of your literature explain the key variables then from there what do i mean i want to go again more a little more practical if somebody has a topic of 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 let us talk about uh environment and the uh, environmental factors and the quality service delivery not so so be able to explain what do you mean by environmental factors which authors are talking about that at an introduction uh, you know when you are, i'm going to give an example of uh, the cup of porridge not so all of us are familiar with the analogy of porridge in a cup not so it has a top layer which is a little warm and cool it is going to introduce you to the hot stuff the body so give us what what is it like for us to to see that you are going to review literature which variables are there the, the second one we go to the body okay body we remember we said the different types of reviews if you are going to review using the topic or theme this is why it should come out clearly use subheading if dividing the literature topically or thematically or according to the argumentative perspective or according to the period of time and you remember know, writing is like a cooking you have the ingredients but mix those recipes for us such that we have a meal so take on each of these approaches second be sure you show the relationship between the source the different sources and we shall see that in the next slide discuss the source of significant okay i'm, I'm about to finish it so uh, discuss the different uh sources of significant contribution again the sources members i will take you back to the table you remember members you remember this table our sources is the reference not so corresponding with the main theoretical perspective with our research question or the hypothesis which design is there so this should come on board and don't forget every argument you bring that does not stem from you append an in text citation we shall see how you in text cite okay we go back to our do not develop ideas or use sources that are irrelevant to your thesis bring only what is relevant to your thesis well you know when you carrying out references pay attention when do you reference in using past tense or present tense you know for instance references to past studies should be in past tense and references to narrative or text other uh, you know than studies that should be in the present so if we, you are only narrating uh, a reference that is in the present use the present tense so uh, even at the panel don't be teased i know some panelists can say you are using the present tense yet you are reporting it. you are giving us a dissertation or a finding or you are reporting your your findings so be able to know these two positions when you are writing your literature a best example is there for instance according to evo's study of comparison or, or excuse me, of composition as uh, students uh, assuming this is an english teacher you are making a study about english teaching a composition student included both male and female subject she concludes that gender plays i think we use she concludes later on we shall say she suggested or she suggests that so be able to know when do you use present tense and past tense this is what i meant i think those two authors author x for instance if we are talking about teaching english composition what does author x say does author x agree with y if they agree what is their thought and you know make a, a conclusion build a conclusion 
What does author, you remember in your table we said, what do you conclude, you remember? Bring those conclusions in your text. Does this confirm, uh, confirm the findings of, maybe what author X is saying confirms what author Y is bringing? You are bringing a similarity in your literature review. Bring out the strengths and weaknesses. In other words, members, I want to emphasize this. When you are writing literature review, do not end by bringing the author in the argument and you don't give us your commentary. Give us your commentary. Give us what does author X about y, say about why? Where is the scholarly debate? Good reviewed literature should have a scholarly debate and controversies. When writing a conclusion, yeah, assuming you are concluding your literature, one, summarize ideas, the conflicts, the themes, the theoretical periods. So summarize what you've, read, you, you've written or you read. Contextualize your topic within the summary. Identify the gaps. Members, literature reviews about gap, gap identification and gap analysis. And those are the three major gaps. Members, well-reviewed literature should have knowledge gaps, should have theoretical gaps, should have methodological gaps. You remember we talked about the theories in that table. We talked about methodology in that table. If we actually use the quantitative analysis or quantitative study, they reported on the figures, bring it out clear that X only brought the quantitative figures, yet this study would also explore the qualitative aspects, hence leaving a gap that this study seeks to cover. So when concluding, make sure and appear scholarly, every gap you are bringing, give us which author left that gap. Have the transition, the next chapter. Tell us what is going to happen in the next chapter. Uh, as I'm winding up, signs of well-reviewed literature. One, should have commentaries on every citation you are bringing, comments. There should be agreement and disagreements. What is your interpretation of this literature? Arguments for or against, what are the gaps? Okay, that I did say. As I'm winding up, I want to bring this aspect of plagiarism. Members, be aware. Plagiarism is passing off other work or other people's work to your own as if it is yours. Whether intentionally or unintentionally, for your own benefit. Plagiarism is an intellectual theft. You are taking information which is not yours. This work can include the ideas, compositions, designs, images, computer codes, uh, or certain courses, certain words without citing. For instance, Shakespeare said that love is blind. So for you, don't just come up and you say love is blind and you're not quoting Shakespeare. That is lifting information that's not yours. And plagiarism includes all those six according to Galavan. Includes using another writer's words without proper citation. Using another writer's ideas without proper citation. Citing a source but reproducing exactly word by word from the quotation. So remember to paraphrase in order to overcome this. Borrowing the structure of another person is right up. When you borrow the structure, I remember last year there is a student who we are telling, this structure is similar to student so and so. Borrowing all parts of another student's paper is plagiarism. Using paper right services or a friend to write for you. Some of us will use these research engineers. You want somebody to help you write. That is plagiarism. In the text citation, so to avoid the plagiarism, you can cite at the beginning of a sentence, and if it is direct quotation, put the pages. If it is at the end of the citation, and you have quoted, you put the author, the year, and the page in brackets. 
Are we their members? Any text, everything you are you read uh, does not belong to you. Cite it in the in your work. That's what we are calling in-text citation. Finally, your API referencing style. When you are everything you have been citing in the text, make sure you put it in your reference list. If you have if you have read books, give us the year, the the number, the name of the author, the year, the title, the place of publication, and then the publisher. Members be guided by the table, empty table I showed you. If you are citing edited books, that's how we cite them. If you are citing journals, that's how we cite them. They are journals with the DOI. That is the sample of the journal. You put the DOI number if you read such a journal. If it is a URL sample, members, when you cite work from the internet, give the date of retrieval. So give us retrieved from this and this. And finally, if you are citing an open citation, a website which has no author, this is how we cite them. Thank you very much. That was my presentation. Questions and answers. Anybody with a question? Thank you, Chairperson. I hand, I hand over back to you. Thank you. Thank you, the presenter. <laughs> I have uh, picked a few things from your presentation. I hope I can be loud enough to share them with you. Most importantly is that literature review is not gambling. It is evidence. And as you write this evidence, you're trying to cover the gaps, to identify the gaps. And those gaps should be following what the presenter has mentioned, the methods used, the theories used, the reviews that exist, and the history of what you're writing about. If you look at the flow of this literature review, you will realize that it is in line with the flow of chapter one, at least for Nkunda University. The other thing that is important for you is that you need to be critical. It is a critical evaluation, but importantly, you should have themes. Let's avoid writing as if you're writing a novel. Let you have themes that will guide your literature review. You need to be factual and you need to be clear also to be able to bring out your voice. My boss is suggesting something, so I'll hand over the mic to him. Hello, members. I think let's first take tea because I know you can't hear anything. Let's first take our tea as we wait for the rain from side there, which I resume. So those who are serving, please serve very fast. We shall resume after the break for the, the tea.
of the author. Okay? And again, citation is very important. And the third method is quotations, where you quote verbatim, where you quote the author verbatim. Yeah, I'm putting it there. Where you quote the author verbatim. That one must be in quotations because you're using the words of the author, not your own words. But try to avoid quotations as much as possible and paraphrasing. The best method is understand and summarize, but make sure citations are there. That way you avoid plagiarism. Thank you. So many Thank you, Professor Raj, for the additional comments. Can we please take questions for Dr. Pio? Who has the mic? Rogers? Questions on literature review? Questions on literature review? Rogers, there is a hand here. Thank you. Another question so we can answer them at once. Another question. There's a hand there. Okay, Professor. Hello. 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 Uh, thank you very much. When you talked about whether you, you are to show your stand, your, the researcher's voice is what gives your stand. Your, your voice should accompany your stand. When you put your interpretation and the, and the comment, that indicates your stand. So if you don't indicate your stand, again, you are lifting worker from one book to another. And that's not review. So literature review is about examining, critiquing, interpreting, and giving your voice, which is your stand. Thank you. Somebody sent a paper here, I was asking about whether they can quote professors, doctors, personalities. If the work is not published, you can't quote. We quote published work. Okay, so it is work that is published, that is quoted. And also your conceptual framework 
should guide the way you are going to review your literature. So your theoretical framework, conceptual framework, and study objectives, they guide your literature. Thank you. Members, uh, I'm quoting professors, doctors. Uh, you don't quote the word doctor. The word doctor, the word mister, his excellence, those words don't bring them. Okay? When you quote Muiru Mubi, not doctor. No, 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 no. Okay? Then another point which I wanted to emphasize. Literature review starts right from the beginning up to the end, okay? Don't think that it only starts in chapter two. No. Literature review covers the whole work, right from chapter one up to, up to the end. Thank you. Thank you, professors. I think... Um... That's all we had. I'm handing over to the director on guidance on how. Uh, the the researcher's voice. It is very important that when you are doing literature review, your voice, you as a researcher, to come out. Because you are dealing with other post works, there are, there are chances that your voice can get lost in the other post works. So I want to hear your voice as a researcher. How do you hear that voice through doing a critical review? When you are doing a critical review of what the literature, your voice can, is coming out by identifying the such gaps. Now, if I read your work and I say I don't hear your voice, it means that you have not identified the research gaps from your literature. Then the, the question of doctors and professors being cited it doesn't arise because you are quoting an author. You don't quote a title. After all, when I write my book, I'm not, it won't be your doctor Simo. No, you find there are Simo. Okay? So I don't know how you're quoting on the title of doctor. I don't think it will really arise. So um, thank you very much. We are going to to the next presentation. Where's my? Yes, we are going to to the presentation by Doctor Kasuja Paul. And uh, the chair of the session is uh, Professor Kaseke and Francis, but uh, we are not here. We had expected uh, to, pay, to chair online, but I don't think he will be able. So I want to ask uh, again, maybe uh, Dr. King to chair this session. So you can chair this session. Uh, please. Uh, I, I want to hand over this mic to you and introduce us uh, the topic. Thank you very much, Director. And uh, my work is simple. Uh, we are going to have a presentation uh, by Dr. Kasuja. And I would like to invite Dr. Kasuja. He's a renowned researcher and he has published two. How many, how many minutes? It's one hour and fifteen minutes. Ah, it's one hour. Yeah. One hour and fifteen and and fifteen minutes. Yes. No a duration. Yes. From just yes. It's one hour fifteen minutes. Okay. 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 Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Kasuja, you are welcome. And uh, Dr. Kasuja is 
is here to give us a presentation on quantitative and qualitative studies. You are welcome, you will use 45 minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, colleagues. <clears throat> uh, I have prepared this presentation <clears throat> in summary, but uh, issues concerning methods of data collection is actually quite detailed when you go and read uh, some books. But as this presentation and this seminar is for master's students, uh, at our level at master's, we can have the basic methods of data collection and these are the basic methods but those students who are here and their phd candidates this is not enough uh, there are many other methods of data collection for both qualitative and quantitative approaches uh, i'm kasuja john po i'm a senior lecturer in the school of education <clears throat> Uh, what is data collection method? Uh, the data is a collection of facts, figures, objects, symbols, and events gathered from different sources to make appropriate decisions. So many researchers think that data, data collection concerns with ordinary human beings, but it can go beyond human beings and go into other objects of a company, maybe vehicles, it can be figures, it can be symbols, depending on the nature of the study. So one thing you must know is that although data is a valuable asset for every organization, it does not serve any purpose until analyzed, processed to get the desired results. So you must bear in mind that when you are going to collect your data, you must collect it for a purpose, not just to leave it there. So what is data collection in, in, in reality? It is a methodological process of gathering and analyzing specific information to proffer solutions to relevant questions and evaluate the results with primary focus on finding out all there is to a particular subject matter. So you set out your own objectives and you set out how you are going to collect that data in order to solve a given problem or a problem in question. So it is also pertinent to know that while you are collecting data, there is what we call primary data and secondary data. A good example of the two is if, for example, if we are here and we experience an accident at the main road there and we rush there, when we rush there, we are going to find people there who have witnessed the accident and we ask them how the accident has occurred. Those people, they will be giving us primary data all primary information and then after all of us we shall go to our respective destinations and we shall be narrating how that story or how that accident has what happened and that narration is secondary data so that, that's the difference between the two so as a researcher you must be in position to know what type of data am I collecting? Is it primary, is it secondary? And why do we collect data in research? Uh, the first aspect of it is integrity of the research. A key reason for collecting data, be it through quantitative or qualitative, 
is to ensure that the integrity of the research question is indeed maintained. And we must also collect data to reduce the livelihood of, hope, live, livelihood of errors. Uh, by the time you collect data, you decide to go and collect data, you have, you have uh, eliminated an element of guess. Now you want to find out and make an informed judgment and decision based on quantified data. And it can also help us to make the informed decisions because we are collecting authentic data. It also helps us to save costs and time. So you have to set your objectives and ensure you collect data on a given phenomenon so that you save time. And this will help you also to support a new need for the new idea. All change, all innovation after that data correction. Then qualitative and quantitative data correction methods. A qualitative research method of data correction does not involve the correction of data that involve numbers or numericals but it is based on the non-quantifiable elements like the feelings, emotions, and perceptions of given people towards a certain condition. So the moment you study is based on qualitative, that, uh, qualitative research, then that study should be in position to collect data based on those feelings, emotions, and perceptions of respondents towards a given condition. Uh, and an example of, of such a method is open-ended questionnaire. So you, you may be in position to use such a, a tool in order to find out the perceptions, the feelings, and the emotions of uh, respondents on a given phenomenon. While qualitative methods are presented in numericals uh, and they are subscribed to a mathematical uh, calculation to deduce. And this will call for closed-ended all scale questionnaires because you need to scientifically prove uh, through means, correlations, regressions, uh, mean more than the median. And so that is the, th those are the two types of uh, data correction approaches. But specifically, one of the major key method of data correction in qualitative research is the interview. An interview is a face-to-face -face conversation between two individuals with the sole purpose of collecting relevant information to satisfy a research purpose. And it uses tools such as audio recorders, digital cameras, and comcoders. Comcoders are gadgets that have uh, both the audio and the video recordings. So they can be in several types. You can have structured interviews. This is the most commonly used type of uh, uh, method of data correction. And uh, this is a verbally administered questionnaire. And it is, in terms of depth, is surface level and is usually computed within a short period of time. The only weakness it has, it lacks depth because it is structured. You have a structured program to do. You go and ask a question. After that, you ask another question uh, in a structured way. So you will get the information, but you not get the information in depth. And then there is semi-structured interviews. 
Uh, in this method, there are subset several key questions which cover the scope of the areas to be explored and allows little more leeway for the researcher to explore the subject matter. So these are semi-structured in form of uh, you, you create situations where, which example can I give here? Uh, in this situation, you, <clears throat> you subsist what, what that interview, I'm looking for the best example for you to give. Okay, we shall pick it. Then there is unstructured interviews. It is an in-depth interview that allows the researcher to collect a wide range of information with a purpose. So this one, uh, a researcher has, uh, has set some objectives to achieve in the interview. But in this case, uh, it is not structured that after this question, then I'll ask this question. After this question, I'll follow this question. Uh, this will depend on uh, the researcher's response for you to pose another question. And the, on the advantage is that it is so detailed, you collect very in-depth information, although it is time consuming, but it, it, is, it is when you are collecting such data in, in terms of qualitative data, it would be good for you to use such a, a method because you collect data that, that is both relevant and irrelevant. But because the interviewer has to give you that answer, then it can lead you to another information. And this can help you in synthesizing and analyzing your data. Then the question is, this is the process of collecting data through an instrument consisting of series of questions, all items, all prompts to receive response from individuals it is administered to. So sometimes it can be both qualitative, it can be quantitative, but in most cases it is quantitative. But in most cases, in sometimes when you are doing qualitative research, and you need to collect some uh, data that is quantitative, uh, you can use this method to collect data, but this data uh, mathematically, the way the higher it can go is a mean and, and a standard deviation. So, and analy analysis will be depending on what we call descriptive analysis. For quantitative, for quantitative research, uh, we call questionnaires and could be some people call it a questionnaire survey, others questionnaires. And on the questionnaire, there are three kinds of questions used. We have the fixed alternative, we have the scale, we have the open-ended. And these fixed alternative are the ones decided are strongly agree. The researcher decides for the respondent, for the respondent to make an informed decision on what the researcher has provided. And there are those that are scale, they are ranked one to five. And these ones, uh, they are also for quantitative. But they are also what we call open-ended, where the researcher has to answer questions depending on 
how he feels about the question that is being posed to him. And these are common with qualitative approaches. Then we have the observation method, and it is a type of data collection is gathered through observation. The nature of an observer's participant, a participant as an observer or a complex that require serious observation for you to get information. For example, if you are in a class and you tell students that, do you wash your hands after using a toilet? Those are observational methods of data collection. It uses tools like checklists. Uh, these are detailed, uh, depending on the nature of the checklist you are going to use. And uh, it states the specific criteria. That is what we have talked about the nature and allows users to gather information and make judgments about what should know in relation to the outcomes. So they offer systematic ways of data collection about specific behavior. Here you are dealing with behavior, you are dealing with knowledge, you are dealing with skills. So these cannot be seen, they can only be observed. So it calls for observational uh, method of data collection for you to understand what exactly uh, is this conduct or behavior or knowledge or skills. And it is hard for you in, in qualitative research to do a study of such nature and you do not use observation as a method. And then there are direct observations, like one we have talked about, this is an observable study method of collecting evaluative information. The evaluator watches the subject in his or her usual environment without altering that environment. You don't need, the moment you alter it, you are not going to get the desired results. The moment uh, the respondents or your target respondents get to know that you are observing them, then the, the behavior is going to change. The skill is going to change, and eventually you are not going to collect valid data from it. So you must ensure that the respondents do not know what is going on. Then there are focus, group, this focus groups or focus group discussions. The focus group discussion is frequently used as a qualitative approach to gain in-depth understanding of social issues. The method aims to obtain data from purposes selected groups of individuals rather than from a statistically representative sample of a broader population. Here, the researcher identifies a certain group of his study interest that is more characteristic in terms of the problem and you engage them in a discussion as you are collecting data and you're observing them. Uh, this target group can be, maybe you are doing a study on prostitutes, you are doing a study on students and you need to, to, to find out what there is in what you want to find out from them and you engage them in an in-depth discussion for you to collect that information you wish to collect. Uh, of course, there are, there are 
uh, techniques used in trying to determine these groups and how you are going to design the checklist and how you are going to design the discussion and how you are going to manage it. So it is not just about uh, finding the group yourself, but you also need to know all that nomenclature about it. This method involves and the open-ended questions call for discussion. They, they are not closed-ended. And it is very common in social science research uh, and the basic research in general. And these groups uh, could be grouped in, in the form of six to 10 people to provide the feedback. So if it is a large group like we are here, then we cannot form the best, uh, the basic focus group in its principle. So because the more it is less, the more you understand a particular phenomenon. The more it is larger, the more you miss out many things. And you must ensure that everyone is a participant, but those depend on, uh, on your checklists. Uh, there are types of focus groups. Actually, there are many, but these are the commonly used ones. We have the single focus group here. Uh, it is interactive discussion of a topic by a collection of all participants and a team of facilitators as one group in one place. So there is a group you pick and then you engage them. But there's also another one. Uh, so the, the first one is the most commonly one used, but there's also another one where we call that two way. Eh? The first one is a single group, but it can also be called the one way. But this one is called the two way. And here, one group watches another, answer the questions posed by the moderator. After listening to what the other group has to offer, then the group that listens are able to facilitate and draw different conclusions on the matter. So here you have different groups. You engage one as the rest are observing. And then after they can also make uh, more discussions and they come up with more conclusions. And then there's a dwelling moderator. There are two moderators who play the devil's advocate. And the, the main objective, the positive of that dwelling moderator focus group is to facilitate new ideas by introducing new ways of thinking and viewpoints. So these devil's advocates are those who have done, uh, those who have been watching PhDs, uh, vivas, we have what we call a devil's advocate. The person who gets to read the, po the, the problem very well and meets uh, the respondents and try to pose challenging questions for them to incite them into more submission of what the problem is about. Then all what we have discussed can be summarized as follows. Uh, where you see methods, uh, those are the methods of data collection, questionnaires, interviews, group discussions, documentaries, and observations. But of course there are others, but these are the commonly used ones at our level. Then the method you choose determines the tool or the instruments you are going to say that you are going to use questionnaire as a method of data correction, then you have to choose. Are you going to use open scale or closed-ended questionnaires? Then you have to choose. If you say you are going to use interview as a method of data correction, then you are supposed to use an interview guide as a tool or an instrument to collect data from that method. If you decide to use group discussions 
all focus group discussions. Then you are going to use focus group uh, discussion checklists or group discussion checklists. If you decide to use documentaries, uh, you can also use the documentary checklists. If you use observation, then also use the observation checklists. Uh, if the method is documentaries, uh, sometimes if you are doing studies in ethnography and uh, back to the literature of a bit, and sometimes we can quote where there is no information that is very key. You can quote a speech of, of that individual and what exactly he said to assert the influence of what you want to find out. And this, if this happens, then the documentary is, as a method, is not inevitable, is, 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 is not what? You cannot dodge it. Uh, I'm going to post this. So there, there are many, there is a lot to talk about in this topic. And on the e-learning system of the university, I have the post, I've actually posted some of this information in detail for group discussions, how can it be conducted, uh, what are the do's and the don'ts, and questionnaires, how to design a questionnaire, but the time cannot allow us here to go through into that. But on the investor e-learning system, uh, this information is there. Uh, I also have these references. Uh, these are the latest references on this topic. 2021, 2020. Data collection and validating data, a simple guide for researchers. I will also post these documents on, on the e-learning. Thank you. Again for Dr. Kasuja. Dr. Kasuja has brought us this far on data collection methods. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Can see. Uh, one, are the methods of data collection, which are quantitative and qualitative. If your study, if your study is a, a quantitative study, remember to use questionnaires. So the design you said should give you how you are going to set your data collection methods. If you remember to use interviews. Hello? Are you able to hear me? Okay. Okay. So we are saying if your study is quantitative, what I picked from this presentation, you use questionnaire surveys or a questionnaire. If your study is qualitative, you use more open-ended questions or, is, or uh, data collection methods or tools, which are interviews, focus group discussion, uh, document. Okay. Observation, thank you. So that is was the gist of this presentation. If you have any question, the emphasis is on know whether your study is quantitative or qualitative. That's what will guide the method you use to collect the data. So thank you, anybody with a question. Yes, bro. And members, I want to ask you that uh, this is the right time to ask, actually. This is the part where you should ask many questions. Now we are here really collecting, analyzing data. If you don't understand anything here, ask. We are all here to answer those questions. Yes, somebody, the, the person in the microphone, there is a question here. And he, Dr. Kasuja and other panelists, we shall respond.
Test again. Baba, you can turn it off. Okay, thank you. Yes, another person. We shall respond. Okay, thank you. We take a third one. Yes. And we answer those first. I request we first answer the that, those three sets, Doctor Kasuja. Okay, thank you. Uh, the first person say asked a question. Should respondents in a group be in uh, of one profession? Depends on the nature of the problem and what you want to find out. But in most cases, this group what we emphasize should have the same characteristics. Uh, it is not possible for you, if for example, you want to engage a discussion about prostitution and you bring in, uh, you, you bring in the prostitutes and the nuns. So you may not get the information very well. So it is, we always emphasize we, it, a profession, but we always say they should, the respondents should have similar characteristics, okay? Because the more they have similar characteristics, the more they are free to express themselves to the, to the researcher. The more they, they are known, the more the information is going to be hidden and you are going to lose. So it is always that target group you, you are interested in that has similar characteristics about the problem under investigation. As someone was talking about reference books, I'm sorry, but members, at master's level, I don't expect you to rely so much on going to the library and looking for books physically. I don't think you have that time. But whenever you have internet, you are moving with the library. And there are many sources in on e-learning. Actually, at Nkumba University, there's what we call an e-library. 
So you need to register with the librarian and get on the system, and then you can access all of the books and sources you want from Oxford University, Cambridge, and all other new sources. You, it can is you can easily access those books. But if you are going to the library to look for a book, like the source I've given you for 2021, you are going to be very disappointed. Uh, even when you go to Makerere, it is not there, but it is on the e-library. So uh, that information on uh, e-learning library, all on the Google Scholar. There, there is a lot, there is a lot in every different aspect of our professions to find those sources. They are very available. I did my PhD at Makere, but I never went to Makere University Library. So it does not mean that you are supposed to go to the library. Actually, when you go to the library, you will not find the sources that are recent. For example, you know, they tell us that when you are doing academics, writing, you should not quote, you avoid quoting sources that are exceeding. Yeah, you don't quote sources of, eh? because they say there is no more research done since then to improve on that condition. So you should avoid also quoting sources that exceed 10 years. And you can only avoid that if you go to the e-library, if you go to Google Scholar and find those, that information you are interested in. As someone was asking question here, do we need to include both the open-ended and, uh, and closed-ended? Yes, sometimes, sometimes you find some questionnaires that have both, and sometimes you find questionnaires that have only quantitative and others have qualitative. For example, if you are going for interviews, uh, you will not have a questionnaire that has closed ended, it will be open ended. And if you are collecting uh, numerical data, you always have questionnaires that are closed ended. But sometimes someone would collect data and has uh, an element of collecting statistical data that is uh, qualitative data that could be included there to hear, to, to see someone who's point of view on that given aspect. So it is not, it is not limited, it is liberal, but uh, it, is more, it is more simplified if you, are, if you have designed the question here for quantitative approach for closed ended, and also design a question here that is uh, qualitative in nature. Because you'll find that sometimes the qualitative aspect of data collection requires specified respondents uh, who have been at whom you deem knowledgeable about that, that information. So, and that will call for specific uh, instrument to, to be designed to collect that specific information you want. So that the information, the data is not scanty and does not disturb you in that analysis. Uh, another one was asking, can quantitative and quantitative methods be used at the same time? It is the next presentation. Uh, someone saying, how do we call, qualify qualitative and quantitative objectives? Uh, the indicators of qualitative and quantitative objectives, for example, to examine, to find out. <laughs> yeah, uh, the object, the nature of the problem will determine whether the problem calls for asking questions or for verifying hypotheses by the problem, not the researcher. And there are many, many researchers who tend to 
to love more or to feel comfortable with qualitative research than quantitative research. But in the world of academia, it is important for everyone to have knowledge about qualitative and quantitative research. Because in the end, you, there is time where you are going to do research that is unavoidable in both approaches. Thank you. Thank you. Can we, uh, can we take on some questions? Yes, Prof has a, a submission to make. Uh, Professor Norman, you. Okay, someone with the mic first, then Professor will give you a submission. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Prof. Professor Norman, then we shall respond. Thank you very much. It's a big break. Okay. This one is okay. Thank you very much. Can you see this session? Prof. Yes, please. For the presentation on collecting data. Now, the most important aspect of doing research is collecting data or information. Analyze that data following methods that have been researched on and approved. To start doing any research, you must identify yourself the what we call. A philosophical paradigm. A philosophical paradigm is what helps you to follow a particular study given the parameters within that, uh, that paradigm. Who are you? Because academicians, researchers, will understand your problem, will, will understand what you are trying to research and your conclusions based on that philosophical paradigm. And the philosophical paradigm is approach the presenter has given to us qualitative approach research. The second one is a quantitative approach to the research. approach. And these three approaches have characteristics so that when you tell me that you're doing a bit of research, my judgment, my take most of that, I move along with that approach. I don't. I don't evaluate your research from the project aspect. Mm -hmm. 
Now, the second aspect which I wanted also to, to, to emphasize, uh, what Dr. Kastuja has presented to us, the issue of questionnaire. The issue of question, questionnaire. He has explained to us a questionnaire. Now, questionnaires, if you are doing quantitative research, and depending on the variable that you are searching, okay? Social scientists are advised to use questionnaires. For you, you call it questionnaires, definitely. But we have what we call scales. We call them scales, we call them instruments. Are we together? Okay. So for us, we are asked as social, social, the social scientists, to use instruments or scales or what you call questionnaires, okay, which have been developed and validated and are published. So when you write your, your article and you send it to the publisher, they will ask you, you, you are measuring this. Where, who published, who developed this questionnaire? So, unfortunately, we don't teach psychometrics here, but the science of psychometrics is on how to develop questionnaires for your study and also for maybe clinical purposes. So you are going to find in literature, okay? I'm talking about motivation. There are so many, there are so many questionnaires or scales which have been developed to measure motiva motivation. You are talking now, which other? Can I have an example of one who is studying something, a variable, want to measure something from you students? Not yet? Not yet. Now, if you want to measure hmm, addiction, okay, you are studying on addiction, you, there is a questionnaire or a scale or an instrument which has been developed to measure addi addiction. So you don't simply come out and say, I, I've, I've come up with a questionnaire. Hmm? Disagree strongly, disagree, la, 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 la. Well, thank you, that is for your own conception, but for academic purposes which are valid and reliable, dated and published of literature, journals, author of that publication with data. And he quotes the author of the instrument and where it was published and that kind of thing. Scientifically, that's what we follow. Now, I was talking about psychometrics. Psychometrics is a study which is taught in most universities, in all universities abroad. Okay, to masters and doctoral students, because you, you must know how to develop a valid and reliable instrument. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. That is, we shall continue to share. Otherwise, we clap for professor members. We got that kind of rich information. Uh, some friend from School of Education asked about observation methods. Give a response. Someone was asking about, so it depends on, on 
how you are going to question the questioning technique. Uh, of course, you have to know that if you are dealing with, con with sensitive problems, some people, the respondents, may not be interested in giving you all what you need. And that will depend on you, the researcher, your skills in testing those questions and validating them, which this one we call it uh, validity and liability of your questionnaires and see whether these questions will bring the information you really deserve or you want. And the moment they do not, that means that you have designed them in an improper way that needs to be revised. So, but in most cases, uh, sometimes they may know a little, but it is not advised as a researcher for you, for your respondents to exactly know that you're observing them. Because remember, you are not observing, uh, you are not observing blood or what. You are, under, you are trying to understand behavior. And the moment the person performing it understands it is going to change it. So it is always good for you to hide it until the right time you find out information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kasuja. And uh, to add, we either use direct observation or indirect. So check and see the nature of your study. What does it call for a direct observation or indirect? Is it participatory or non-participatory? So check. Thank you. Uh, I will request we end here with the Dr. Kasuja's presentation. Oh, Prof, you have a... Prof will be the last, then we will continue to the next presenter. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Doctor, <clears throat> and the members. Um, somebody has is asking some questions here, which have been passed over to me. But I would also request other professors to uh, take part in answering these questions. The first question is: uh, How can one come up with a problem statement? So the issue is the problem statement. And that problem statement comes up in chapter one, okay? Uh, which Professor Rach has already talked about. Now, where does the problem statement come from? That is the question. Eh? Before you decide on a topic, you must know what you want you must have looked at a certain situation. Somebody here was talking about motivation. People are not being motivated. So now you come up with a topic about motivation. But what do you want to see that motivation doing? Okay, improving on the performance of the lecturers, of the workers. Now, you just go deeper to set some variables or a constructs for independent variable. Eh? The professor here talked about the cause and the effect. Eh? Two, you start so looking about what is the issue at hand. And by the way, when you're talking about a problem statement, never talk about a problem. You're only showing the signs, what shows that there's a problem, okay? Now, when you ask me here, uh, how can you come up with a problem statement? It's just right from, from the topic. Then you also go to the historical. Somebody talked about when you are addressing the issue in the introduction, okay? Where you have the historical, conceptual, contextual, and theoretical, okay? You know that I think that institution has a certain issue which is not working well. So that's where some of those problems come from. Now, um, I don't know if some professors will also add on. Does someone want to add on? Thank you, Professor. Uh, I still have some questions here, but the professor is what 
is assisting. This is with this is with um, <clears throat> the question of where does problem statement come from? Okay, the problem initially comes from you, the researcher. I mentioned about the I mentioned about the need to know. When you don't know something, you ask a question. And the, research, the problem statement commences from the question you ask, what you want to know, okay? There are very many unknowns. And some of those, some of you have already read my script, should have seen that section on uh, the, on asking questions. Asking questions is human nature. When you don't know something, you ask a question. And that question is the one you eventually develop into a problem because you want to know an answer, okay? And to get the answer is what you go through this methodology, et cetera, to find the answer. Once you have found the answer, and then you, are, you, have, you have completed your research. So the problem, is come, the problem comes from you. It's the question you ask, which initiates the problem statement, okay? Because there is a, there's, a, there's an issue for which you want an answer, and that is the problem. In which case, you have to explain it very, very clearly. What is this problem? Okay, so that your readers are able to understand the problem you are investigating. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much, Professor. Um, the second question is, how can you write a background of a study? Actually, that word is not background of a study. It's a background to you always make that mistake. Right? You always write background of, it is background to, to the study. Now, how would you write that? Okay. You have your introduction. Also, this also is coming up in what? In the introductory part. Uh, Dr. Kasuja wants to. Thanks very much, Doctor. You can explain that. Yes. <laughs> Uh, the background of the study, or the background to the study. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the background to the study has four elements. Uh, the historical background, how has the problem evolved over time? And here, you begin with the global perspective, the national perspective, and then the study area perspective or the problem perspective in your study area, in that area. Then theoretical background, what are the theories which try to explain your study? Uh, you can pick two, all three at master's level and also show how they are related to your study, how they relate to your study. And then the conceptual background, which is the definition of your variables. Uh, in your topic, we have the independent and the dependent variables. And how do you define this? And the definitions of these begin with scholarly definitions. How, these, how do other people define these variables? And then after you tell us, according to this study, how do you understand and conceptualize these variables? And how are they related? How is the dependent variable related to the dependent variable? And that's what we call the conceptual background. And then the contextual background is finally you tell us the ideal versus reality of your problem. Uh, what is on the ground? against what should have been of your study problem. For example, if, if there is a man 
who is legally married to a woman in, in a church. So the idea is that these two people must stick to one another, okay? So what is on the ground is that the man is practicing adultery. So you are doing a study to make sure that this man stops to practice adultery so that he can live according to the covenant. And that is ideal versus reality. What is on the ground is the problem and what is uh, the ideal should have been the right thing. And that is the, what we call the, conceptual, the contextual background. Thank you. And in most cases, the contextual background is where the problem is. And those people who know how to, these professors, they always read there until when they reach the problem statement and they see whether they two are, are, are what related. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Dr. Kasuja. Now, the, the last question here is saying, how can I compute the data I have obtained from the field, okay? Now, computing the data, okay? Now, there are some formulas which people use, for example, now, let's say now you have, you have gone in the field, you know the population, you know the targeted population, now you want to find out the, what the sample size, okay? So you can, for example, use like the formula of Sloven, Sloven formula or another formula. But when you go further, okay, there are some other formulas which you might find which are also very appropriate, okay? Because you are not limited, eh? depending what you are doing and depending what you are studying. Now, when you go further to analyze the data, now you use, for example, like Excel, you can use SPSS, okay, and other programs, Stata, and what have you. Now, um, Dr. Ki Dr. King also wants to add on here. Dr. King, please. Thank you very much. That question basically pointed to how do you handle the data now from the field? One, edit your data. Two, you do data coding. You code. You enter your data according to the nature of the questions that you had. You are going to use SPSS, a hypothesis. And you are going to use SPSS. The hypothesis should have been a null hypothesis because SPSS is defaulted to analyze null hypotheses. If you use SPSS, you'll be cheating. And that's why they'll get you at the panel. So your objectives vis-a-vis -vis the hypothesis now to the data you have collected, you want to analyze it, enter it. If you can't get somebody to code for you and enter for you data, you may need assistance if you don't know, okay? But your nature of quantitative analysis should take three levels. One, you are going to analyze descriptive statistics using measurement of central tendency. When you measure mean and standard deviation, the second level you infer that's when you look at inferential statistics i, I hope we are in the same wavelength so far up the first one okay now the problem is some of us we, are, we want to analyze the data only using frequency and the percentages that is that batch undergraduate and diploma not masters and then which analysis? Then what are you going, which conclusions and which recommendations are you going to make at master's level? So you can only recommend if you use inferential statistics at master's level, okay? That's why in your objective, either you wanted to find out a relationship between the variable X and Y, then you infer. So first level of analysis, we look at descriptives. You transform those percentages to get the mean or the standard deviation that you will use to give you the relationship between the variables. 
that is quantitative. So if your study is purely quantitative, we use descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. And in inferential, that's when we run into, if you want to know the nature of relationship, either use Pearson's correlation, okay? If we want to go in for measurement of effect, that's when you regress third level. So you will check a bit on that. The nature of analysis in the quantitative analysis is either descriptive or inferential. Now qualitative, you are handling data, qualitative. You either use content analysis or thematic analysis. So when you come up with your tools or instrument, show us how you analyze. And it should follow systematically the way you write up your chapter four and five with your conclusions and recommendations. I hope that is clear. And I know it is, it is creating, some of us, we wanted to analyze only using frequency. How many times have you entered the class? What, what, what conclusion do you give on that? If you enter the 20, okay, how many times the members have you stood up here? Then we say 20 times. Then we say how many, how many people have stood up 15 times or 20 times? I think that. Then you compute percentage. Which conclusion are you going to give from that? We need to go and we see the relationship, the relationship between your standing and your state of life. I think that. Then there you can run a call. There you can even make a recommendation that members, I stood because it was raining, it was cold. Uh, I members. Then there you have things that can be published. They, uh, they will go through peer review. Okay? So I hope we close that conversation. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, Prof has something to add. No, I'm not. Uh, okay, sorry. By the way, there are many questions here. Um, I don't know what we're going to do. Uh, but those people who are answering, please, let us be, be very brief, okay? Uh, uh, thank you very much for that clarification on analysis. It is a long story. It is quite a long story. Now, before I do any analysis, you must first establish what type of data measurements you have, okay? What type of data have you collect collected? Now I'm on quantitative, quantitative analysis. Now, the type of measurements we have in research, okay, we have what we call interval or ratio data. That is one interval or ratio da da data. Now, this type of data is captured from an instrument which has got or oh, Likert scale kind of, Likert scale, I don't know whether we understand Likert scale. Agree, disagree, that kind of thing. So, so if you have that instrument, the data which you, are go, you have captured, we call it interval or ratio data. Then another one is what we call nominal or categorical data. Nominal or categorical data. What is nominal categorical? It means yes, all or no. Now, then we also have what we call ordinal. Ordinal measurements. If you are measuring, you want to give information on levels, okay? I am in first year, second year, third year, okay? That is what we call ordinal because it has different layers. And that information, that data which you have got, is not the same as the one which you captured from the record scale, whereby you asked a, stu a respondent to say, to express his opinion, whether agree, disagree, neutral, that kind of thing. Now, each level has got a mechanism of measurement, 
Okay. If you want to do correlation, you want to, to correlate correlation, correlation analysis, then you use the, the first, the interval, okay? And you do the correlation analysis. Now, if you want to predict, if you want to predict, we use inferential. If your research is to predict, okay? If it rains, okay? Many students will need a jacket. You want to predict, then we use inferential statistics plus others, ANOVA, that kind of thing. So know the measurements, please. Your data should have what type of measurement data I am dealing with. Data has different specifications. Thank you. Someone said, Dr. Kasuja, may you please elaborate between independent variable and dependent variable in a topic? Yes. Uh, your research topic must have two variables, the independent and the dependent variable. Uh, but before you go to the topic, I don't advise you to look for research topics before identifying research problems. First, identify a problem. When you identify a problem, you already have identified a dependent variable. And when you look for the, that factor which tries to explain the occurrence of that problem, then you have looked for a depend, an independent what? Variable. So I think that is the best. I, an example, if this is a school and in this school, students have been passing have been passing in the uh it is a, a known school that students keep on passing but in the past five years the the, the performance of these students has of in the school has declined so what is the problem there poor what poor performance and this poor performance even has statistics in 2015, uh, 100 students sat senior six and only 60 passed, 40 failed. So it keeps on deteriorating up to the point where it is a big concern. So it becomes a what? A problem. Then you tend to ask yourself, what is this problem? Then you keep on asking when activated, are they paid? If the teachers are not paid on time, then they don't have time to teach. And it's the reason why the students are failing. So a, another factor comes in to explain the occurrence of why the students are failing and it becomes, uh, it becomes a lack of teacher what? Motivation. So the moment you get the two, you, have, you can easily develop a topic from that because you already have the dependent and the dependent situations. So from there, you can come and say, maybe the impact, maybe the what of teacher motivation on students' performance in a given school. You see how things become easy. Now, another one was asking with sufficient examples, what is the difference between the null and research hypothesis. Uh, these are studies that are quantitative in nature and they, they, you have to verify these hypotheses statistically. So the research hypothesis is the one that the researcher wants to verify. And for example, you may say that uh, You may say that, uh, okay, and that hypothesis can be uh, verified statistically, and that becomes your research hypothesis. 
then the null hypothesis will be the one that opposes what you are saying, that smoking does not lead to cancer. So because there are two dividing views, it will force you to go to the field to testify and find out the truth based on statistical evidence so that uh, you come up with one and the two hypotheses are complementary. If one is true, the other one is false and vice versa. So it can't be that they are all true or they are all false. One must be on the other side and the other must be on the other. But that should be, that is tested statistically. Thank you. Okay, uh, there is uh, one question that has uh, come that requires more details and I requested the, the chairperson to open her com his computer is going to answer this question. Someone wants to find out to, uh, clarify how to clarify the distinction between cross-sectional and baseline surveys. Uh, and it's going to be answered. Uh, the presenter didn't answer it because I think I'd limited him more on, the, on that part. So Dr. Ching is going to give it to us, but uh, after that, pardon? we shall have another presentation. Can you answer that? <clears throat> okay, yeah, Dr. Norman will also, will also hint on it, but it cannot, you can't get satisfied from learning. So, <laughs> so otherwise, thank you for the questions. Uh, I'm happy now that you're asking questions. Then I know you are learning. But otherwise, from the first uh, topics, you are not asking. I, and I wondered why we had uh, called you because you were not as given. So, uh, Dr. Chin, are you ready? Thank you very much. I'll, I'll get back a bit. Hope we are seeing. On your conceptual framework, you will have the independent variable and the dependent variable. And this is showing us how you can use your conceptual framework to formulate objectives. You can have an approach of one to one or many to one. The indifferent aspects that measure, for instance, if it is motivation against performance or service, delivery. So you have on the, the first indicators of motivation. In motivation, we have intrinsic and extrinsic, not so. So you put there intrinsic number one, extrinsic number two. In other words, you will have an objective that relates intrinsic and staff performance. Okay? So that, that will guide us. It is a many to one. This one is, then this side is a one to many. How do you conceptualize performance? You give indicators of performance. So this, the way you conceptualize your conceptual framework and operationalize it is what guides you to formulate the objectives and also reach the hypothesis. I ah, sorry. Then we have a many to many. Uh, we are bringing this because the supervisors, sometimes a student can come up with a given approach they started in a class, and the supervisor is using another approach. So we want to find a middle ground, a point of, yes. So if it is many to many, this congested one down, we get the indicators, the elements of your independent variable or the K 
key indicators or the aspects that measure your independent variable and those that measure your dependent variable so you can decide for instance in our motivation we looked at intrinsic motivation against an indicator of performance for instance we want to look at those who are passing in the first grade are you seeing that members or second grade if that's how you are measuring performance according to your study but if it is in terms of efficiency not so members once they are efficient uh the the, the, the people are performing so it is intrinsic motivation against efficiency not so members so i'm bringing that such that we know objectives don't just come from nowhere you are, somebody asks a question on conceptual framework and now you're asking a question on objectives and on hypothesis this is how we reach the hypothesis the way you conceptualize your conceptual framework the way it is operationalized vis-a-vis -vis the indicators even in the measurement of the variables when you will be constructing your instrument you will come back to this point no you just construct a bit here you can't do any more no you can't no you can't use this uh you'll you'll forgive us a minute we you come we come we pick it <laughs> I want it to go. I want it to go. Mm -hmm. No, wait, wait, wait a bit. I want it to save me. It's over here. What did it go? No. Okay, okay. It is. You can remove this one. Is it because of the other thing? No, I want it. No, let me we close no. this. One sec. We close this. Because it's just a mess. Wait a bit. Now put it put the put the flash in. so members anybody with a question on how we use conceptual framework to come up with the objectives uh we are only supplementing what you should have asked earlier on or complementing now the third one the second one is on somebody asked about the design uh, how do I know whether I'm to use a cross section or whether I'm to use a, uh, 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 whatever design? Now, the design, that's one there. the design that we are to use, again, you need to know. Professor Norman talked about the philosophical paradigm. I don't want to take you in that direction so much. But what we need to know, know whether your study is quantitative or qualitative, practically. If it is quantitative, so our, our friends were on that side. And the research design is like a plan of the house. It guides what you want to put on, your, on the ground. So it is uh, either qualitative or quantitative. So you are saying in that last bullet, before choosing a design, the researcher should consider the purpose, the objective, hypothesis or study questions that's why we Arrangement.
I, I'm not I'm not explaining much here for some reason. Do we? Any question on this? Now a bit on excuse me qualitative studies. <laughs> We are, we are categorizing for a reason such that when Professor Norman comes to talk about mixed method, you know what you are mixing. Excuse me, members, you don't mix eggs and onions, they will break. Even if the cat resembles a rabbit, they are not the same. So we treat them differently. Okay? For qualitative studies, here we want to look at people's, people in their context, people in their context environment. Now in this context, are we looking at this context historically? Do we want to know people's culture? If you want to study people's culture, you go ethnographic. If you want to study a given case at a time, use a case study. And in the, either an individual or an individual institution, If, if, if you want purely qualitative, some of you may want purely qualitative, what the study will dictate you use qualitative study. That's when we're going for the grounded theory. Now, members, from we, when we look at grounded theory and the ethnographic studies, we can not avoid completely. You can't avoid being on the field for a longer time. You remember the question you asked on observation? That's when you are going to be at the field for six months plus. So the nature of design you are choosing qualitatively, no. Don't say for me, I want grounded theory and I went in the field for two weeks. No, it can't be. Because here you are targeting to come up with a theory in grounded theory members, not so. Phenomenological, you are targeting to know people's experiences in life. If I want to know, for instance, your experiences when we started in the morning, that's when we use phenomenological. So are we clear on the designs? Know when to use qualitative and know when to use quanti quantitative. A little bit, we are going chronological. For you, I'll borrow some two, three minutes. Even in the sampling, when you go sampling, the, the probability sampling techniques are for quantitative. So know what you treat on the other side. Don't mix eggs with onions. Mix them for a reason. Use the mixed method maybe if you want to make an omelet. Not so members. That's when I will cut them very well. I've already known what I want to mix. But if you still want to eggs in their own shape and an onion in its shape, the onions will affect the, the eggs. Not so members. So that's why I decided we use simple random sampling, certified. And when we come this side, we go by convenience or per passive, or we go snowball. Remember, research is logic. A plus B gives us A, B, not A, C. Uh, that's why after that, we will go to collect data. You remember what he, Dr. Kasuja took you through? The questionnaire survey or the survey are for quantitative data collection methods. And the methods should not be mixed with the instruments. That's why we have a questionnaire survey, we have interview observation this side, and on the side of qualitative, we have key informant. Some of you are making a study about students' performance, then you say, students are my key inf informants. No, they can't be. Where would you put the either class representatives or the classroom teacher of a given subject or the headmaster? Those are the key informants. For, then you, you can put these other people in a group discussion. And a good interview should compose of five, 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 three to five, six members. Because you are seeing one member at a time, they have quality information you can't get from others. Focus group discussion, a good focus group discussion should have at least five to six members or eight if it is too much. Then observation, not the nature of observation as we said when Dr. Kasuja was presenting. Okay? 
Then the documentary the analysis, you might consider people's testimonies, those who witness what happened. Those people in the CRD, we might go in for artifacts. You want to study the different uh, artifacts. Uh, if I finish, we are looking at the instruments. Remember, the instruments, if you come chronologically quantitative on that arm, follow quantitative, not so. If it is qualitative, follow that. We shall see when you have to mix. What, what do you mix and how do you mix? The other side, we had a, survey, a questionnaire survey here. We have a questionnaire. It is an instrument, not a method. Yeah, that's why you have an interview guide. And you remember up, we had key informant interview. Then we construct interview. Actually, you can even ask three questions in an interview guide. I'm asking, what do people understand by motivation here? How do people get motivated? Then you leave them to talk as you are recording, not so. Then you'll generate themes later. Then what is the performance in this? How do people perform here? That's an interview guide. But in a questionnaire, you came up as Professor Norman said, there are specific tools that measure motivation. Intrinsic and those close-ended questions on different scales are there. And even the nature of data you are targeting is clearly known. Okay? Then lastly, it is the analysis. Some people, uh, why, why we decided the, we want to see the flow. And these are got through measurement of mean. You are getting us the average, the medium, the mode, the standard deviation. And in inferential statistics, we will go back to those of us who have done QM or statistics or research methods, and we were introduced to analysis. Inferential statistics comes in, what Professor Norman was talking about. You either run Pearson's correlation, either Spearman's rank, or you, we look at chi-square, you regress, all those things. At master's level. And finally, qualitative, we look at members, please note this. This is what you need to put in your proposal or dissertation. So you don't say for me, I think I want to analyze quantitatively. And so what is the analysis? I analyze the quantitatively. I analyze the quality. I don't know why these people don't understand that I analyze the qualitatively. So thematic analysis, you come up with the themes. We are giving you pointers. Research methods, okay? And we are here. You can consult the professors that are presented such that we share information. Thank you so much. There were questions here, several, but I think they have been covered. Now, of course, you are still a chair of the. Uh, I know you are at a different level in your research methodology uh, seminar courses. This is just a seminar. So don't get intimidated. Those of you who have just started research methodology or you haven't started. You are going to learn most of these things in detail by your facilitators who are going to take you through a semester. So you can't learn these things in an hour, okay? Those who have just come. I know we have people here who are just beginning in, your, in their classes. I, we have those who are going to the field and those who are writing. So it's a mixture. So colleagues, don't get intimidated with these things. You're going there then we we after this session we are going for lunch and the uh our service provider is on the way coming yeah once we finish the questions we can relax and wait for lunch uh thanks very much director can you please assist me? Uh, there is a message here from the it section that please subscribe to uh, our YouTube channel. You'll find all these details. Eh? I don't know, you may need to explain more about that. 
IT. Okay. Um, uh, there is a question here. Um, uh, but uh, somebody still requires more explanation. The question reads, I need more insight into choosing and determining a research topic, okay? I think we have already discussed that eh, in detail, but in any case, we can still add on. Um, I know we have got some schools here which say that your research topic must be in a subject you are studying, eh, where you're going to graduate, if you are management, if you are accounting, if you are whatever, okay? But I think some people have their own choices, okay? If I know that I'm going to get a job in a bank, I can choose my topic relating to what? Okay, sorry. Um, if I know that I'm going to work in a bank, why can I not write my topic in, in the banking sector? What is the problem? Because you must know what you want, okay? My interest, get to know where your interest is, okay? If you took a certain course, then you can write in that line. Eh? But actually, I don't think there should be somebody to force you that you should write in that course. I don't think that would be fair. Now, another point we talked about the problem statement, okay? Do you have, is there a problem you are trying to investigate? And that problem will guide you to what type of topic you are going to choose. Another point, you choose a topic and you want to go to research, could be at Nkuma University, okay? In accounting department, but you may not get access to that accounting department. So it will be difficult for you if you have taken such a topic to get the results, okay? So you get a topic where you know you have interest and where you'll be able to access the information. Okay, it's very, very important because many of you are getting stuck. You don't go to the banks, you sit down there around the tree and then you fabricate the data. And let me tell you, that's plagiarism. If these banks came to Nkumba here, you would be arrested. Yes. Okay, I uh, could be uh, Professor Raj, okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Now, what we are carrying out as we come in is complementary. Hmm? It is complementary. When you see something that to add, then we come in. And the purpose is to make research as clear as possible. Now, about, let me first address myself on how I treat topic selection, topic selection for research. Now, when my supervisee comes with a topic and says, this is what I want to research on. I close my eyes because I say, I need the problem first. You must first develop a, pro a problem. If you don't have the concept of the problem, there is no way you can come up with Hmm? with the variables of study which can give you a good, a, a good research. Therefore, our students, my approach to that is first come up with a statement of the, pro of the problem. Now, quite often, and researchers have also noted on this, you can even change the topic of study after you have completed your research and the write-up, then you come to suit 
what you have come up to come out with. So a topic, let it be just tentative. Don't get scared, okay? Now I, I can't understand the topic, this kind of thing. No, 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 a topic is just tentative. Once you have the problem, we can easily formulate a better topic for the start. Then after you have gone through, then you say, according to what I've found out, I think I can rephrase the, to the topic. It is acceptable in the research. Then, uh, oh, I'm forgetting something. Oh yeah, I've remembered this now. Research designs. A research design? Design. A research design. Now let us do it like this. Hmm? You want to go to Nairobi, to Mombasa. How do you reach Mombasa? How do you, what means would you take to go to Mombasa? Can you help? Uh -huh, one, bus, train, uh -huh. airplane. Very good. Now you go back to your village. You want to go to the whale. How are you going to reach the whale to collect water? Bicycle, uh-huh. Wait, okay. Now, okay, a research design is a method to reach your destination. A research design is, how am I going to reach Mombasa? I am going to do A, B, C, D. Now the A, B, C, D, okay? The A, B, C, D is dictated by the, the research appro approach. Now let's say that going to Mombasa is the quantitative, okay? Please, going to Mombasa is the quantitative what? Drive means to, to reach Mombasa, okay? Concentrate on aeroplane, uh, road, Taxi, taxi. And let us take going to the world as the qualitative what? Approach you are going to use. So the research design in going to the well includes walking, bicycle, and do that. Don't mix eh, a bicycle. <laughs> oh, a bicycle to, 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 to going to Mombasa, which I will say, yeah. qualitative so that's the little i can i can add on as far as to understand the research design each each approach has got its own research design design and they have been demonstrated over there don't mix them and unless you are going to do the mixed methods thank you thank you very much and uh, are there more questions as we wait for lunch? Are there more comments? We have looked, yes, uh, Dr. Kasuja, there is a question. Someone was asking, what is the significance of a researcher going to the field yet it is as well possible to conduct research inquiry from one who's room. <laughs> no, it is not like that. I remember when we are doing research, we are doing research to improve on the condition in society, organizations, they could be schools, they could be NGOs, they could be government agencies. So because of that, we have to conduct research and go in the field to conduct research so that we come up with informed judgment. Because at the end of it, when you are doing research, you are going to change policy in an organization. And these policies, the, the information you get to change policy must be really authentic and not based on guesswork or in your room or anywhere. Because you are going to make things, you are going to improve on the certain condition in, the, in your workplace or in an organization. Thank you.
But, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we can add something on that. The guy who wants to do the research in the room, he's doing it with his wife. What is the problem? Eh? What is the problem if the topic is acceptable? Eh? But <laughs> in normal circumstances, okay? In normal circumstances, that's not tenable, okay? Please. <laughs> okay? <laughs> I think a uh, professor just talked about the research design, okay? Okay? The, the approach. Yeah? Uh, how are you going to do that? I think it's very difficult. And let us be very, very... Yeah? And again, if you are carrying out could be literature in literature review, something might come up, I don't know. Huh? But let us be very, very careful, okay? Yeah. <laughs> But go ahead with your wife and you do your research. Okay. Re research, it depends now on what type of data you want to correct. To correct. Now, today, there are varied ways of carrying out research. Now, if my instrument, okay, is online, we can send instruments questionnaire which are designed on which are designed for online so that wherever you are i send you that instrument in your office then you check it you you score it and you send it back to me okay that one is also accepted now for us who do not have those facilities to send questionnaires online to a, a school if you are doing research in a school there is no way you can send that questionnaire and stay in your room. You have to go there physically. But the Bazungu today, uh, they are using a lot of online what? Huh? I think this question, the, the person who asked a question wanted to, to know that, wanted to find out that he's already knowing what is happening in the field. So he can sit in his room and they do the work. That's what he wanted to mean. <laughs> oh, well, eh? okay. <laughs> I, I appreciate the take of the professor, but also my take is also valid. But <laughs> thank you. So I, I think the questions are over. Want, oh. Uh, but before that one, there was something on methods, instruments. I think some of you have been hearing the word tools. Eh? There is a thing about tools, okay? And many of us confuse instruments with tools. Eh? Like I said, for example, if you are having a jacket, it's raining now. You are having a, your computer. You are having your camera. Those are what we call the tools. They are not instruments, eh? but many of us confuse that, okay? There's research methods, research instruments, and the tools, okay? So please don't confuse them. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was, we are trying to put something, I hope you are seeing. One member asked here, can I have a sample of a checklist? That is a sample of an observation checklist. Okay? You indicate what you want to observe. Are there classes? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, doctor. Come. That's, an, that's a sample of an observation checklist. You observe classes, library, then in the laboratories. Then you check the activity. Indicate not for us which activity you saw and what was happening. Then if you saw, you tick. When you are giving the information, when you are writing the findings, you indicate according to the observation made. Are you seeing that, members? Then that's what, you indicate what you observed and the corresponding activity, and you make an analysis on that. So that is an observation checklist. Same thing with the documentary checklist. You indicate the documents you are going to, ob to, to observe, to review. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chinji, for 
first of all, for sharing and also presenting. Pardon? You have a question? Okay, Dr. Al has a question. Dr. Abao has a question. But I want to first ask, you know, our lunch is coming in the five, 15 minutes. We have one uh, presentation remaining. I don't know how is your stamina now. Do we, do we wait or can we continue this, this presentation? Then we eat at once and you go. Now, I want to put a question. Those who are saying we should continue, say I don't say no. Ah, the, the I have it. So after the question from Dr. Waho, I'll ask uh, Dr. Actually, Dr. Waho, you're going to share the session. So ask a question and call call him. Um, thank you, Director. It's not really a question, but I'm again seeking clarity, uh, particularly from Professor Mirumubi, on the issue of uh, instruments and tools. And probably for the audience to understand, if, for example, you move with a jacket, you move with a, a camera, and when it comes to the other chapters, how important, <clears throat> how do you use, how relevant is this camera? How relevant is this jacket for the person who is reading your work to appreciate these tools in terms of data collection? What is important here? Is it the tools or is it the instruments? And I understand students um, put tools and instruments. And you are advising that uh, tools should be separated from instruments. So what should someone who is going to collect data focus on and help the person reading this work to understand how relevant these instruments, which many call tools, were in data collection? Thank you. I, hand, I, I would like to hand over back to Dr. Ann as the chair for the new session. Mine has ended. Please, Ann. Thank you so much. The men have said they won't answer my question, so I have the pleasure. <laughs> okay. okay, before that, let me answer the question. It's okay. Well, have the little I had. Okay, uh, let's see members. The instruments are the physical questions you have written to tap data. Those are the instruments. The tools, the camera that you will use to take snapshots is a tool. Another tool, if I want to go with it, now it's raining, I will use the, an umbrella, the gumboots, that's a tool. That's helping me. I may go if I want to hear more and I eternalize what he, the informant is saying. I may use a recorder. That is a tool. But the instrument are the questions that I put on the paper that is guiding me. That's why we call it an interview guide. Thank you. That's what I wanted to respond. The equipments, equipments are the tools. Yeah, they are the tools. So tools are different from instruments uh, uh, and tools are the same as equipments. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Pio. Members, our next uh, presenter is going to be Professor, Professor Norman Nsereko. And he's, he's going to take us through understanding the method and approaches used to obtain data and information from the field, specifically using mixed methods. Professor, please take the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, chair, for introducing me. 
on this very important journey of research. Unfortunately, I had prepared some handouts to help you follow, okay? But the photocopier person has not brought those copies. I don't know what happened. No, 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 it's just down there. I went, I went to, to I told him, I have some work whereby you can make it day to day because it has been raining and you have not got customers, but customers are up there. Can you make copies? And you came together, said, ah, yes, I'm going to make them. Where is he now? Where is he now? Yeah. But I would advise you because I wanted to give a presentation and a practical hand zone to help you understand hmm? better. But we don't have it. I don't know how we're going to organize that now. Hmm? May I have a volunteer among the uh, assistants here to go and inform that young man down there that the copies are needed right now? Very good. Okay. Now, before I start, uh, may I politely ask you to stand up a bit? Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, would you please? Oh. You are doing the gym, eh? <laughs> okay, okay. That can can do. Please, can you can you look uh, in the face of the one who is next to you? Can you? Okay. We we can sit. We can sit. <laughs> you can have. You can resume your sit seats. Resume, yes, that's all. Now, I'm introducing you, I'm introducing you to mixed method research, mixed method research. And before we do that, I'm going to ask you a question, I'm doing research. Okay, I asked you to look to face your neighbor. Now, the research question is this. I'm going to ask you for answers. If I am crude with my words, you will excuse me. Question is, what is the sex of your, the person you, you 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 first. No, no, no. One. I want one. One by. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. She's a male. Uh huh. Yeah. Yes, please. He's a male. So we have we have two answers so far. Yes, please. I don't know. Very good. You have answered, you have answered philosophically, scientific, scientifically. We do research. We do research, which is scientific, scientific. Okay. Our research is not a common man's answer. Hmm? You go on the road and say, ah, that is not real research we want. But for us academics uh, uh, who are pursuing academic work, we should do scientific research, research. Now, why did I ask this question? I was asking, okay, to find out what is your philosophical view in answering a, qu a question. Because research depends on the philosophical view or paradigm we have. Okay? Now, for the one who told me my neighbor is me, male. Another one also told me male. Okay? 
How did you come to know that this one is a male? Okay. Huh? <laughs> How do you come to know that this is a male? How? Bec huh? How, how did you come to know that to say I don't know? Okay. Now your answers, your answers depict what should be covered in what in research, research paradigm. Those who say, oh, I've observed because of your observation. Okay, you are saying male. Others are saying, I don't know. Okay, so those who say this one is male or female because I observed, because I touched, because, okay, you are, you are doing what was called quantita, quantitative research, research. Those who answered my question, maybe they, they didn't give me the answer, and they asked the neighbor, are you male or you are female? That is quality. Qualitative. Then the one of mixed me methodology would say, don't only depend on your observ observation. Do not only depend on your uh, inquiry, asking questions and getting an interview and getting an answer. But if you want to know fuller truth about this person, okay, you can observe, you can interview, or you can even take to some other place and really find out whether. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, my <laughs> plate. Okay. Now, this is what helps us, okay, to do research. Where is your philosophical stand? My philosophical stand depends on asking inter on interviews and getting a feedback through through talk talk that is qualitative and it is acceptable in research then for those who do experiments those who do survey that kind of thing is quantitative quantitative and those those who want to mix the two that is what we call mixed what research very very good so the starting point to do research you must identify yourself with what is your knowledge base Okay, what we call epistemology, knowledge base. Okay, eh? how do you come to know that this is a this is a male or I don't know? How do you come to know? That is what we call knowledge base in research. And what is the reality? Why do you say is male is a female? That is what we call ontology in reality. You must have that before you start to do your research. Thank you. Now, this is the intro. This is what we are going to look at. Introduction, definition, characteristics. Let me skip this. We shall see it. Then the phases. Now, the introduction is on the concept, on the topic which was given for us to address. What do I understand by obtaining data and information from the field? Stroke data collection. Now, data collection, okay, is a process of gathering and measuring information on variables. Okay, gather information about your study, and those are the variables. Okay, we have variables, we can have different variables in our study. Hmm? Some, some authors call them independent, and others call them independent and deeper dependent depending on the type of design quite often if you are doing quasi okay, experimental and experimental that's where they apply mostly the independent and deeper dependent variables because this study is going to give us cause and effect this causes this one are we together if you are not, it is only experiment and quasi, which brings about cause and effect, in fact. Others are correlational prediction, 
Hmm? Correlation, if you, are, you want to correlate this and this to find out the strength and direction, it is a correlation between two variables. Then if you are doing qualitative, if you are doing qualitative, we don't use always talk about independent and dependent variables. Okay. Now, so when we do this, uh, obtain, when we obtain data and information, it is about the stated research questions, or we test hypotheses, or we evaluate outcomes according to Kabil. Then, what is mixed methods? Okay. Now, mixed methods is a recent is a recent methodology or approach. Okay, it is a recent methodology to do research, mixed methods. It is an approach, a different approach. Because the first approach we have is qualita, qualitative. The second is, then the third is mixed method. Okay, it is quite new. And unfortunately, we don't even teach it in our university here. We hmm? we look at qualitative and quantitative. Quantitative, and there are some schools which would even dictate you must do quantitative. My God, eh? please tell the professor. Eh? Oh, I'm very sorry. I will not do that. I want to do qualitative. Qualitative. Oh, I want to do mixed math because all these methods have been proven that they can answer your research questions. Okay, they can expand knowledge, therefore they are valid, provided that you fulfill their method methodologies. Okay, now, so in when we talk of mixed methods, it means that your research, okay, will have the component of qualitative what research research and quantity mixed together. So you cannot talk about mixed methods when you don't have that component of qualitative and quantitative. Sometimes the problems I get with my uh, supervis supervisors is that they talk, they say, I am going to use questionnaires and also, uh, interviews, okay? Meaning that in their research, they are going to have the two aspects of qualitative and quantitative, quantitative. But when they do the writing, you don't see anything. Hmm? That smacks of mixed method. He talks about that, but in his presentation, it's only qualitative, qualitative or quantitative, quantitative. Therefore, the methodology is already wrong, and you can even tell him, please go to back to your village. Okay. Now, that one I've talked about. Now, what about mixed method research? Now, mixed method research involves mixing or combining quantitative and qualitative uh, info data. Research techniques, methods, methodologies, approaches, paradigms, concepts, or language into a single study. Please, if you are going to do mixed method research, research techniques as appropriate, the methods, okay? Quantitative methods, qualitative me methods must be prominent. And then the paradigm is very important in research. If you don't talk about a paradigm, what how should we understand you hmm? how should you understand you so the problem is very important now why do we embrace mixed methods in research training okay one to overcome the tendency to rely on known methods there is that tendency whereby professors others rely on just qualitative or quantitative quantitative but mixed method says you can bring out qualitative, you can bring out quantitative, combine them in your study, 
and then you are going to enrich the understanding of your study, all the information that you are going to produce and also contribute more to the academic world as you publish, okay? Okay, so characteristics of mixed method research. This is very important, characteristics. If you are to do mixed method, okay? So you correct, you analyze both quantitative, okay? Quantitative, we use closed-ended, okay? The closed-ended, those are the, the already, okay, designed questionnaires or instruments. You want to measure uh, performance, and if you have the design instrument to measure performance, then it asks you either yes or no, all, I agree, disagree, that kind of thing, neutral, or extremely agree. Now that is what we call closed-ended uh, method. Then the qualitative open-ended, open-ended. Open-ended means eh, I ask you, I give you an interview and you speak, you express yourself. It is up to me now, okay? To codify what you are saying and to establish the themes. What are you talking about, okay? Oh, in, in Uganda, oh, the, there are so many uh, people who are dying on the road. And then, you know, after that, uh, you, oh, oh, on the lake, there are people, they also die, la, 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 la. You, you speak, you say so many things, but I get a theme. You are talking about, what, are, what is he talking about? What is the conclusion you get from there? What is the conclusion? Accident? Accident. He's talking about accidents. That is the theme is you've got from the narrative of your uh, respondent. Now, we use rigorous procedures in correcting and analyzing data appropriate to each method's tradition, okay? So it means that you must know very well the quantitative methodology. How is quantitative? How is quantitative methodology carried? How is qualitative carried on? If you don't know, if you are not good in those, then mixed method is going to be a bit hard. So you must be, you must know something or you must know it well. Okay, then we use, use procedures that implement qualitative and quantitative components, either concurrently or sequentially with the same sample with different samples. Now we shall... And these are the designs which we must uh, follow. Now, ah, number four. Number four has come back. Who can read number four for us, please? Do you have it? Number four. Who can read number four? Ca ca can you please read number four? Oh, you will not be a teacher because the voice is, uh, can you raise your voice? Okay. It starts framing the procedures within the philosophical theoretical models of research. Yeah? It has come back, the paradigm has come back, the philosophical, without a philosophical paradigm, understanding, we shall not understand where you are. We shall not understand where you are. Hmm? It is like in politics. Hmm? When you go to, to when you go to America, they have the Democratic Party, not so. And then they also have the, the Republican, yes. So when you are talking, yeah, you people should know the way you talk is rep Republican, then they understand you from that perspective. If you talk as a Democrat, then the people will know, ah, yeah, what he's saying, yeah, that is his paradigm, his philosophy. Therefore, in research as well, you must identify where you stand. If you are doing qualitative, yes, say, this is what I believe in constructivism. That is the paradigm, constructivism for qualitative. And constructivism means, okay, that paradigm says that reality and knowledge, okay, is co constructed. It comes from the, pe the people. Truth is what 
comes from the people who give it to you. Okay? When you ask people, you give them an interview, what they are giving you, that is constructivism. They are constructing truth from what they are saying. Okay? Now, yeah. If you are doing a qualitative, we have post uh, positivism, post positivism. Okay? For them, they say, like positivists, you have you have to uh, to get reality after you have measured. You have measured. Then let's continue. Qualitative approach. Yeah, I've talked about that. Quantitative. If you use post positivism, for them they say research is the process of making claims and then refine or abandon some of them for other claims considered stronger. Okay? That is your philosophical point of view. So if you are going to do qualitative and you, you said my paradigm is going to be posit positivism, follow their philosophy, please. Follow their philosophy, what they teach. They say for us, if you are doing posit posit positivism, research is the process of making claims. You make a claims, then refine, Okay, if you find that ah, something is missing, you refine them. It's not like a positivism. For positivism, the natural sciences, for them, they say, we have made an experiment. That is all finished. That is the truth. Positivism says, uh, uh, sometimes you are biased. Sometimes things don't work. But for us, we say, if you want to get uh, reality knowledge, okay? If you want to get the true information knowledge, we test, okay? We test, and if we find that uh, things are not like that, we can abandon that and then come up with the other way of knowing. Now, mixed methodology is the pragmatism. This is very important. Mixed methodology, if you want to use mixed methodology, you become a pragmatist. Okay? Pragmatism. For them, they say anything works. <laughs> anything wa works. You can use this and that so that you may enrich your research. You enrich your informa information. And for them, they say the best way to reach a better, a better take on any research problem, do two things in your research. Use qualita qualitative and use and use Quantitative. Okay. So for them, they say philosophy, which it is a philosophy which states that researchers should use the approach or mixture of approaches that works the best in a little field. Okay. Importance of mixed methods. This is also very important for us, the importance. Okay. So when we use both, in one study, we get a better understanding of the research problems. That is very important. And the complex phenomena than either approach alone. When we use both. So uh, two of my friends over there, they said, we don't know. So for them, they, 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 they would say, let me first hear from you what you say you are. And two, let me prove it through experiment. Eh? make my observation clearer. Then they would say, yeah, now, very good. Because they have combined bo both, they are making the knowledge of the person next to them clearer by using those other methods. Then the other point is the potential to enrich our understanding of problems and questions under study. And hence, we may add value and contribute to advance our research topics. Very good. And to expand the strength of this, you will get it. I, okay. Now, something here from Carl, you should note is that mono methods of assessments might not yield desired results. Mono means one. So if you are to use only qualitative, some researchers may say, uh, uh, you are not enriching us enough. Or if you are only using quality, qualitative. So these are some of the weaknesses people have, have observed when we use only one method of research. 
אוקיי? אז, אוקיי. אז quantitative methods may miss contextual information. Quantitative methods alone may miss the, the contextual inform information. If I give you my questionnaire and you add strongly agree, oh yes and no, you are going to miss out my own eh? take, eh? my own experience. Hmm? If you had asked me, I would have told you, oh, from here you go, la, 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 that I've not been working well because I'm sick and they're threatening me. Okay, you miss out that. Then for the content, if you only use qualitative method, we miss to quantify the issues of interest in a study. Very good. Now, let us look at the purposes. Purposes, and this is very important. What is your purpose? of doing mixed methodology. So mixed, mixed methods, mixed method is, the one purpose is triangulation. Triangulation seeks to converge, corroborate and, corrispo, and corrisp, the corrisp, correspondence of results from different methods. Triangulation means if you use different methods, quantitative, survey, okay, phenomenology, case study, then you can what you have got from those methods you put bring them together and then you get a better understanding then another one is elaboration complementarity okay six elaboration enhancement illustration clarification of the results from one method with the results from the other okay then development hmm? It seeks to use the results from one method to help develop, inform, or expand, okay? If you want to develop something, sometimes you, need, you want to develop, if you want to develop an instrument, we use these two methods, qualitative first and then the quantitative. Then initiation, you want to, you seek to discover a, the paradox and the contradiction New perspectives of frameworks, recasting on questions or results from one method with questions or results from the other method. Okay, expansion. Now, I want you to note this, okay? Before, before you come up with your research questions, okay? Start with one, at least start with one, one research question, okay? As we shall see, research questions for mystic method methodology, you must have one question which covers quantitative, the quantitative aspect of the study. Another research question, at least another research question should have one of the qualitative aspect of the, st the study. And then the third, you should have a mixed, a mixed methods research question. And that is, where we start from if you are to do a research on any given topic using mixed methodology, right? So it is very important for you, even for other, for other method, methods, approaches, to know what is a quantitative research question. How do you frame a quantitative research que question? How do you frame a qualitative research question? question. How do you frame a mixed method research question? So if you are to do a mixed method question and you don't have a research oriented question, you are not doing, uh, you are not doing uh, mixed method methods. Okay. Now, the phases of mixed method research, even these phases actually are reflected in the three approaches of research, qualitative, quantitative, and and uh, equal status, okay. So the first one, okay, is research conce conceptualization. Uh, you have been asking so many questions about how do I start? What is this, how a, a research topic, that kind of thing. So when you are doing research, you have to note the following. You must have a research concept conceptualization. You must conceptualize what you want to start to study, okay? 
Then determine the mixed goal of the study. Okay, now this is mixed methods. Formulate mixed research objectives. Okay. Mixed research objective. This is done in other approaches, qualitative, quantitative. We have to follow this procedure. Determine the rationale of the study and the rationales for mixing quantitative and qualitative approaches. This one must appear in your write up. Then determine the purpose of the study and the purposes for mixing quantitative and qualitative. Then determine the mixed research questions. What are the research? with the mixed method equations as I've talked. Then select, do the research planning now. We are on research planning. How do you do the research planning? We do research planning when we select mixed sampling design and also selecting mixed research design. The design has come back. You are going to Nairobi or you are going to your well in the village. It has come back. Then the third, the third aspect involves research implementation. How do you implement research? Okay, you collect data, you quantitative and qualitative data. Okay, you are in mixed method. You have to collect quantitative and qualitative data. You have to analyze quantitative and qualitative data. Then validate the data, the data sets and mixed research findings interpret the mixed research findings, write the mixed research report. Now, if there, is any, if there is a contradiction in what you have been trying to get from the quantitative and qualitative, then you can reformulate your research questions and do it again. Very good. Now the challenges in carrying out mixed methods. Uh, according to Creswell and, and the Plano Clark, Conducting mixed method research is not easy. I'm sorry to announce this as well this afternoon. It is not easy, but it's, it's, it's not impossible. It is not impo impossible. Not easy, but it's not impossible. You are, people have done it and you can do it as well. Conducting mixed method research is not easy according to Byron, Byman, because it needs more work sometimes financial resources and more time. Then researcher skills, ha, huh, this is very important. If your skills in quantitative are lacking, it's going to be hard for you. If your skills in qualitative, quantitative and qualitative either or both, then you, you are going to get problems. Okay. Oh, sorry, I have... Uh, Okay. Oh. Okay. Now we are going to look at the types of mixed method research design. This is very important. Hmm? This is very important. And you must include in your writing the methodology. Okay, research designs. Research designs for qualitative are different from research, research designs for quantita, quantitative and also research method, methods for, for mixed method. The, different, okay? You must, unfortunately, we have not got that, but I had summarized some of this information here, okay? Now, we have triangulation design. We have a triangulation design. Okay. They are four commonly used. They are four commonly used research designs, please. When you are doing research, when you are studying mixed methodology research and publications, you are going to find this. I someone can use one. That's that's the one. Triangulation. I, then the second one is embedded design. Okay, and we shall see the embedded as well. Hmm. Oh, you can read for yourself. I've summarized it here. Then explanatory design. Now the explanatory design. Okay, some is also referred to as explanatory sequential design. 
This is the most straightforward and the most common in publications. Okay. So my dear friend, this is very, very simple. It looks simpler than anyone. So if you, you use this one, you may not spend a lot of time writing a publication. This and is easier to understand and to carry out. Okay. Now, sequential, it has two phases. Okay. You start with the quantitative data research or data collection. You analyze it. What you have got from the data, then you carry out qualitative research, research data collection. So that the second phase of qualitative may support what you have got from the quantitative part of data collection. Okay. Then another one is the explanatory design. Now, explanatory explanatory is the same. I don't know how it came about. Now, exploratory, I don't know how this. The second is the exploratory, 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 yeah, exploratory. There was a mistake. Hmm? Exploratory. Now the exploratory, sometimes it's called exploratory sequential design. Okay. Now this one, you start with the qualitative data collection. Data collection. After that, you do the quantitative. And this design is very good to come up with a theory. It is very good to come up with a new instrument. Now, okay. Now for my, my PhD, I developed an instrument called University Students Evaluation of Psychosocial Problems. Now this one, this instrument measures the psychosocial problems of university students. It has got four aspects. It measures their emotions. It measures their traumatic experiences. It also measures their academic problems and it measures antisocial behavior. So that one, I started with uh, uh, qualitative data collection. What do people say? What do they understand about psychosocial pro problems? Are they there? Okay, when I, 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 I got the, the data, then I put the, 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 the data, transcribe the data into, uh, into themes, codes. And after that, it helped me to develop a questionnaire, a quantitative questionnaire, which is the instrument now I can give for, my, for research or for uh, clinical purposes. So I used exploratory sequential. It means I started with one, then the sequence was, the quantity, quantitative. Okay, exploratory is more of, what do people say? Exploratory is more of what you capture from a closed ended. Okay, now selecting a type of mixed methods design. Okay, one, you must match the research problem, okay? match the research problem. What is your research problem? What do you want to, 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 to get? What do you want to research on? What is the problem? Okay. Then, what is your expertise in quantitative and qualitative? What are the available resources you have? Time, money? Okay. Then three very important factors, three very important factors, which you have to put in mind is the first one, what will the timing of the quantitative and qualitative method be? Timing means, okay, what will come first? Is it the quantitative aspect of data collection? Or is it the qualitative? That is the timing, okay? 
Then another one is the priority. Okay. Are you going to give equal priority to quantitative and qualitative? Whereby as I as I collect data for quantitative and qualitative, they have the same priority. All you emphasize qualitative more. If you are to, to, to emphasize qualitative more, it means that you give a, a lot of strength. It is a, on that. Oh, you emphasize quantitative. Okay. Now, this, these are the paradigms I talked about. Okay. If you are post, post if you are post positivistic worldview, you have to do quantitative priority. If you are naturalistic, you give the priority to qualitative, okay, when you are collecting data. If you are pragmatic, then you give equal, you can give equal priority all and equal weight. Okay. Now implementation. This is very important. How do you implement your research? Data collection, okay. There must be a data first. The options we have, we have concurrent design and we also have uh, uh, sequential design. Concurrent means you collect data, quantitative and qualitative data at the same time. Sequential, you collect first either qualitative or quantitative first, and then, yeah. Very good. How to, co to conduct a mixed study method? Unfortunately, you don't have this information. How do you? You're okay. Yeah. Now I developed, I proposed, I, I, I proposed a proposal on a research question. And this write up helps you to see how you can write a mixed method proposal what you have to include in that uh, proposal. Now, the topic which, the topic which, are, which is here is investigating the academic staff perspective towards technology enhanced learning and virtual teaching in Nkumba University, a mixed method research, okay? That is what you, I am proposing to research. Now, it is about, what do, do lecturers, teaching staff in Nkumba University in the COVID, okay? When we, are, we uh, adopted e-learning, okay? What are their perspectives? What are their, where are their needs addressed to cut out virtual, virtual learning? Hmm? That is the research, which is a mixed method. Hmm? Where their needs are addressed, is it a, a successful project? Oh, there are some there are some needs which are not addressed, so that the lecturers may carry out virtual learning or e e learning. Yes, I've been informed that they were captured. They were captured. Huh. What about there? Okay. So I just briefly uh, brought about, uh, chose important areas of research. Others I didn't tackle, okay? But these are the...
and lunch is ready. Okay, where, where do I go? Yeah, okay, thank you. Now, when you are writing a purpose, when you are writing a purpose in research, you must follow these guidelines. When you read Creswell, Creswell is very good in re research approaches, he writes extensively on research approaches, whether it's, it is qualitative, quantitative, mixed methodology. You must capture the mixed me methods purpose statement. It must be there. So when you read my purpose, you will find that the, 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 the statement has been uh, captured. Then you have to include the overall content aim. Content aim. Then you have type, the type of mixed method design. What is the type? Is it exploratory, sequential? Is it uh, exp explanatory, sequential? Is it concurrent? Is it triangulation? You have to capture those things in your purpose of study. Then you have to, to capture the forms of data collection that will be used. How are you going to collect data? Hmm? Then you have to capture the data collection site. You must include the data collection site. Sometimes we write purposes even for quantitative and qualitative, and we miss out on these. It happens. Then we have to give the reason for collecting both forms of data. You have to give both forms of data. Okay. Now, we are coming to what we call research questions in mixed methodology. Now, the first question is, what provision does Nkumba University make for academic staff development in the area of technology enhanced learning for the topic which I introduced? Now, this is a quantitative research question. And you are going to use an instrument or a questionnaire okay, to capture hmm, the academic staff area, okay? The, what has been provided by the university to do virtual learning. And this could be pedagogical, this could be uh, uh, tec technical, so on and so forth. That one will be captured quantitatively. Then the second question would be, what do the academic staff need to know in order to deliver blended and online courses effectively. Are these, are these needs addressed by Nkumba University? We are going to ask the academic staff, please, you are, you are, you are, you are doing virtual learning, but were you trained? What support were, was given? We got it from, from interviews. And that is a qualitative, it is a qualitative que question. Therefore, for our study, we have quantitative, and you have also qualita qualitative. Then the third is, according to the academic staff, what instru institutional approaches are required, okay, for technology enhanced learning to be effectively embedded in the curriculum. That one is also uh, qualitative, it's qualitative. Then the last one is a mixed method research question. You must have a mixed method research question standing on its own. And it is how and why do the academic staff, do the academic significant perspectives influence the effectiveness, the effective use of technology enhanced training? So we combine what we got from the quantitative and what we have from the qualitative, we mix it and then we implement and we analyze. Okay, I'm about to finish. This, uh, I'm about to finish, I'm finishing, yeah? Okay. Now, when it comes to methodology, when it comes to methodology, this is very important as researchers. You must have it right as far as the methodology is concerned. If you have a fake, Unsubstantiated substantiated methodology, you lack, you, you risk 
having your work hmm, pronounced as unreliable and not valid. And in the academic circle, once your research has been termed as unreliable and not valid, then that is the end of that research. They will not publish it. Now, sometimes you have a problem here. When we talk of reliability and validity, we only confine it to the instrument you are going to use. Research you, which, you are, you, which you have carried out must show that it is reliable and valid. It means that you must write and tell us whether you carried it according to the research protocol, the instruments you used, the methodology you used, that kind of thing. That helps us to know that the research you have carried out and what you want to publish is reliable and valid and valid. Because why should I waste my, my, my time with a reliable and valid instrument? Because it is taken for granted that whenever you are using an instrument, it must be reliable and valid because it is a, the, 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 the figures are expressed, say, the corona bash is this and that. Okay, so we don't use an instrument which is not reliable and valuable. You just only have to tell us that this instrument is reliable because of ABCD. Okay. Then you, you get this one, it's very easy to read. It's very easy to read how you have to write the methodology part. Now I go to the last. Let me move on to the last. Okay. Detail the different phrases. In your methodology part, you must detail the different, the different methods for quantitative. You write it in full, what you did, how you sampled, how you, you chose the instrument, what instrument you used. Okay, that kind of thing. Then something here which I want to share with you is that when you have collected your data, okay, you must, you, you must measure that data to find out whether it is normal, okay? The SPSS, there is a software which can determine whether the data that you're going to analyze is normal or not normal. And if your data is normal, there are different analysis methods which you must use. If your data is indicated that it's not normal, there is also a different analysis me method. That's very important. Sometimes we have, uh, now a normal, a normal data, when you put it uh, uh, in the SPSS, normal data would give a, uh, uh, it will, it's like a bell, okay? It's like a bell, a bell, it's like a bell. Then abnormal data is one which, which is skewed. You find that it is more on this side or more on the other side, on the other side of the bell. Now, if your data, after analyzing it is skewed, it is abnormal. Uh, normal data should be in a form of a bell and it has the norm cut, it, the, 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 the dividing line is in the middle. You will, okay. Then you also have to come in for qualitative phase. You write that, then the implementation of your analysis and results. Then you have to do the results. You give the quantitative phase results, qualitative phase results, and then in the discussion, you discuss what you have uh, uh, come out from the two methods. Thank you so much. We, are in a, we have been in a hurry, but you can read more. This was just an introduction for mixed methods. Good. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Professor Norman, for that wonderful presentation of the mixed method. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you know, I, I asked you whether you had the stamina to, to have the last presentation before lunch, and you accepted. But uh, somehow on the way, I started sensing that actually you didn't have the stamina. And the, the way you were talking, you made my presenter trust through the work. So um, I don't know whether you still have the stamina that we have questions.
before lunch. Then we close. Can I can I request that we have lunch first? We shall come back here for a few minutes for for the questions, and then we close. If that is the case, if that is the case, I'm going to ask. First of all, I want to welcome our Professor uh, Andrew Peter Igas. Peter's eager. You know, I have a problem for us, my boss's name, eh? because it has a, an S. <laughs> you know, I want to welcome him, Professor Andrew Peter's eager, who is our academic registrar. He will give us closing remarks after lunch. So, can may I ask uh, now, Father? I'm calling him now, Father. You know, you didn't know. You thought he's just a professor. I want to call Father Norman in Sereko to give us a prayer to bless our food. Please observe a moment of silence and we offer this prayer. God, our Father, we thank you for bringing us together here for this academic gymnastic. We thank all those who have prepared it, we thank those who have sacrificed their time to come. And now we are going to have a meal. We ask you to bless our meal so that the strength, the energy we get from this meal may help us to persevere on your way. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Uh, thank you very much. I request the members we remain seated. And I ask the, the the secretary and the people, the serving providers, please, you can ask a group, instead of making people line up the way you made them line up in the morning, I didn't like it. So you could remain seated, they can take uh, at least a part and then we get any, they can come for more. I also want to recognize the arrival of the director Kampala campus, uh, Dr. Yes, eh? yeah, okay. <laughs> Better later than never, you're most welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, so please may I ask the people on, at the table to direct us how we are going to eat instead of uh, everybody lining up. Hello? Can you direct people how they are going to come for service instead of everybody lining up? Let it go. Hmm? I'm requesting members here, professors and doctors to, call, to go first, then they will show other people to follow.
You will not get the money in move. The instructions are there. Whatever again. So you do have as much. You simply go scan that code there. You're able to take it to a Google Drive folder where all of them. Just download them. You just scan the other code. Give you a link. You click that link, then you will see this. Okay. And uh, let me let me sing out the Okay. Okay. Okay.
But uh, the most important thing that I want to mention is that uh, the dissertation going forward shall be first examined by the internal examiner, then the external examiner after the candidate has made the necessary adjustments that will be recommended by the internal examiner. I want you to, to, to listen this very important uh, information. Some schools here um, had a tendency of presenting this at the same time. We have changed it. It will not be allowed anymore. If you do that, your work will not be uh, accepted at the Directorate of Postgraduate. The dissertation shall first be examined by the internal examiner. 
And then the, uh, the work will come back. The student will incorporate the comments from the internal examiner, and then it will go to external examination. So after the external examination, that's when you do your viva voce. Please uh, take note of that adjustment and uh, you'll get more information as we move on. The other thing uh, I, I mentioned in the morning that uh, you are, you'll be required to publish at least one uh, uh, article in a peer reviewed journal uh, where your supervisor is a co-author. Of course, uh, in the morning there was a, a question whether those people who are already in the, in the, the process uh, will be required also to have the same before they graduate. And I said, uh, a guideline is a guideline, and this is a policy which has been passed. But if, if there is any other adjustment, we shall communicate. But otherwise, take it that going forward, we are going to require all master students to publish at least a journal article before they graduate. And then also take note of the 60% the mark that uh, your work will, must be assessed and scored at least 60%. And also final submission, the, the successful uh, proposal also score a minimum of 60%. And then uh, uh, generally, even the dissertation must be marked and you must have 60%. So we are talking about the mark of 60, not below anymore. So at this juncture, I want to call our academic registrar, uh, Professor Andrew Peters eager to come and give us closing remarks. Professor, you're welcome. Hello, good afternoon. I must begin by thanking you. You are making us proud. Those who have eaten, you can clap. I've just come upstairs. I was on Zoom downstairs until he called me. And I've known what students go through when they are on e-learning. I've known what they go through. Now, I must congratulate you, and you should clap for me because I canceled your classes on Saturday. <laughs> but I'm glad that you have turned up in a bigger number, and you are going to elevate our university to a university from a secondary school. Now, when you do research at masters, you have become a scholar. Remember that one. When you do a research at master's level, you are beginning to become a scholar. I will begin by what the last presenter hinted on. And if you forget anything, remember these two sentences. Science is what we know. Science is what we know. Philosophy is what we don't know. And you have no research without a philosophical touch. You have no research without a philosophical touch. We normally ask you, where are you coming from to do what you do? What is your orientation before you handle what you are handling? And until you are able to answer that, then you are not yet embarking on research. Philosophy is what we don't know. And there I will mention three words, three sets of words. There is the word epistemology, there is ontology, 
and there is axiology. Axiology is about value system. I've seen an individual before I woke up to come here, before she started eating her food, she signed the sign of the cross, even after the reverend had played for us. She started, it's automatic. Where do you come from to do what you do? Sometimes where you come from biases what you discover, even when you go to collect data. Your orientation. And we deal with beings, human beings, but there are other beings. Where are those beings by doing what you do? Yes, we are searching for knowledge, but I would like to know what surrounds that knowledge. And answer the question, what is a, what is a paradigm? You can Google it, you will discover a lot of information. And it will tackle the qualitative and the quantitative and how you, put, you bring the two together. So I go back, science is what we know, philosophy. Now I'll begin, you have had good presenters and I'm finding in Kumba University heresy. People are promoted because they publish, they do research. And now it's more heresy than before. Do research are rewarded immediately. We have professors, we have doctors, we have senior lecturers, we have associate professors, we have professors. But whenever you become any of those ranks, you have to defend your level. And your group here, I'm glad to say, lecturers are present, doctors are present. And this morning I was being taught where I was on Zoom. I was seeing things differently from what I knew before. So I'm still a learner. I'm still a learner. And I'm glad that PhD students are among you as well, because they are picking a leaf. So this is healthy, and it's the way to go. Now, I would love that the titles you pick, or the problems you pick, are more indigenous. There is a lot of indigenous knowledge and it tapped. And the people out there, those of higher culture, those who think we should copy them, they are looking to see what is embedded in Africa, in Uganda. So the indigenous knowledge is still missing. So can you situate your problem in the indigenous knowledge and bring it and earth it to us? So context is crucial in whatever you do. Context, contextual framework, you have heard that one, the first chapter, theoretical, contextual, theoretical. And I'll give you another hint. People just say, begin with a problem and read, this, read the theories that surround it. Then at the end, you may even situate your title. And I'm going to contest here. People talk of two variables, but where I come from, you can do it with one variable. You can do it with three variables. I remember in this same room, somebody was preventing. I told him you can use three variables. He asked me, give me an example. I gave him an example, and he said, you will confuse my PhD student. I stopped at that level. But you can use one variable, two variables, or three variables. Honorable. And the truth and the belief are not equated to knowledge. Truth and the belief don't equate to knowledge. Truth and the belief can be on one angle, but knowledge is, surpasses truth and the belief. So what do we have to do to bring the two together or to keep the two separated? So truth versus knowledge. Can we approach our issues from an interdisciplinary or a marathon? disciplinary. The person speaking to you, I'm from an interdisciplinary, but now I'm going multi disciplinary. And that's what constructivism is all about. You should check on Reve Viskoski. Reve Viskoski. Knowledge is what we gather from everybody. We talk about it and we come to what is an agreed position. Even we can agree to disagree. So that will be our, posi our position. 
Now research is, you have to keep on answering, what are you setting out to do? And people may ask, why are you setting out to do it? And then the how comes in, how are you going to do it? But after even the how, you go back to the why. Now, listen to that. This week I was listening to one lady presenting again. She just mentioned one thing which also perturbed me. She asked, how do you know that you don't know? Researchable areas, philosophical questions. How do you know that you know? Where is the proof to prove that you know? So think of those and exploratory and exploratory. Now I would like you again to embrace practice-based researches. Exploration is about practice-based, practice-led, whereby the process becomes the actual research. You don't need to have an answer. But again, when it's practice-based and you have an answer, then you bring in the word exegesis, explanatory, to explain the object, what you have come out as an answer. So I wish you well, and I would like you to keep on learning. Learning is our lifetime venture. Personally, I don't feel good if I don't open up a book, if I don't listen to the, if I don't go to the net. I would hear somebody, I wanted to contest. When Kasuja gave an example, he said, if you are dealing with prostitutes, group the orders in their order and they bring in nuns. And I was about to ask where I was underneath that, supposing nuns are also prostitutes. You have made those two categories, but supposing the nuns are also prostitutes. So I wanted to come upstairs and contest, but I remained down there. So I'd like you to please continue learning. Learning is the way forward. And I would like you to come out with the answers that bail out our communities out of their miseries. Your masters will be nothing if you are not bailing your community out of its miseries. That's why I insist on indigenous researchers. This week I've been called somewhere to vet a research which is fundable, but within Uganda. Why did they come to Nkumba? to look for me, so you can clap for me. Please advertise, and I've told the director already, somebody said, how many master students do you have in Nkumba? I told him, we have around 180. It was a justifiable lie. He said, why don't you give some to supervise? I asked that person, send us your CV, but uh, on the side, I asked, I called somebody else who told me that he has nothing in his CV. He has not supervised any, he would like to begin with Nkumba. So please build up your CV from publication. Begin publishing at master's level. And I whispered to somebody here, I have my niece whom I even sponsored to come and attend this one. She has not finished her master's, but she has not appeared anywhere. I checked on the net. Her name was not there, and even here, she's not here. So love, yearn for knowledge. I have another elder niece, elder to that one, but that one walked to Masaka, but her name was there, appearing. So please yearn for knowledge. We love you for that. Congratulations. I end at that, please. Yeah, thank you, Professor, for those good words. Uh, and I hope you have closed the... But, <laughs> but before you close, someone reminded me something here, and I want also to state it, that uh, we are very, very alert now. We have a, a plagiarism software. Please, we want to warn any students that he, who is taking work to bureaus that a bureau can work for you, and then you submit that work, you'll be wasting your time with us. We shall throw away that work. If 
you take work to be written around because it is a habit in Uganda, some universities around, and we started seeing it also some, there are PhD uh, uh, masters who have thrown away by the way. Some people will not graduate because of that. So please don't uh, be a victim of such a decisions. Try to do your work, and that's why we're trying to take you through these things so that you can have the confidence of doing your work yourself. You can do it, okay? And uh, remember, your work is internally examined and externally examined, okay? So when you do internal examination, the work goes to external examination. External means it goes outside in Kumba University, okay? To other universities within or even outside the country. So you know that very well. But uh, I want to thank you, uh, members, our dear students. I told you you are our guests. As in Postgraduate uh, Directorate, we are very happy that you have been able to come. Those who are able to attend online, we are also happy. Uh, we shall continue doing more of this. Our interest is that you should have quality education. That's what we are known about. And I want also to um, welcome those who want to come and do a PhD at Nkumba. We have a very vibrant PhD here and uh, around eight or nine programs. Visit our website, you'll get uh, more information. Uh, you can tell other brothers and sisters who want to do the same to come. We are already receiving uh, applications for the 2021 intake, and we shall be doing uh, a graduate examination around July. So please, uh, those who are willing, come and join in Kumba University, do your PhD. Uh, Professor, I will. I still call you to close the, the, the seminar. So my duty is here as an academic registrar. I admitted you. Um, I've checked that you have been taught and you have attended this such seminar. And I would like you to see you graduated from here. Can you clap for yourselves? So with those few words, I declare this workshop and presentations closed. You are free to interact as you go. So, well done.